and uh, Chris Alton and Cameron Wynn. Uh, good afternoon, welcome back, councillors. Please sit down. Thank you. Thursday the 22nd of June. Uh, do we have any apologies for any absences? Councillor John. County Councillor Anne Webb, please. Thank you. Uh, item two, uh, any declarations of interest? Councillor Howarth. Yes, Chairman. I have an interest on the agenda item on the motion, uh, Richardson's motion. I think I think it's 8A, is it? I'm not too sure. On the tourism tax. Thank you. I fill before me. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Councillor Howarth and uh, Councillor Taylor, I think you've got your name plates round the other way. Thank you, Chair. We know who we are. <laughs> Were there any other declarations of interest? Thank you. Uh, I believe we have no public questions. None. No, thank you. The chair's announcements. Uh, the reports are as read in in the uh, the, uh, the council mi uh, meeting. Uh, moving on to. Uh, item five, to confirm the minutes of the meeting held on the 18th of May. Uh, is anyone prepared to pr propose those as a true and accurate re record? Certainly, Councillor John. Um, th thank, you, thank you very much. Um, in the minutes, it clearly states that the leader informed us that the Welsh Labour Party had agreed a coalition agreement with the Green Party in Monmouthshire. We were repeatedly assured in the last meeting that this was an agreement that this was not an agreement between the Labour Group and the Green Independent Group. However, in last week's Monmouthshire Beacon, in the leader's regular column to the public, the leader said, at our annual meeting at the end of May, we cemented an agreement with an independent and a Green Party councillor to join us in a formal coalition to provide a steady, stable control of your county council. I don't see what can possibly be clearer than this. It says you've cemented an agreement with an independent and a Green Party councillor to join in a formal coalition. There's no ambiguity in it. It's in black and white. There's been no subsequent correction in this week's papers, presumably because there's nothing to correct. Either the minutes are wrong of our last meeting, and we were misinformed at the last council meeting, or this article is wrong, and the public have been misled. But these two documents cannot both be right. So what's the nature of, of this deal? What was the price that was promised for the roles that were given to the two green independents? 
Um, was it that um, votes will be given when, when required? And is it for the Labour group to decide um, when a vote matters, not to our residents, not to the people who put us here, but to the Labour Party and the Labour group in this chamber? So. This agreement that's been cemented with both Green Independent councillors is no trivial matter. This is about who runs our county council for the next four years? And a dodgy deal gives a, a minority group Chair, effective majority Chair, control is, is this of this a council point for the remainder the of this five-year term. So who has been Excuse misled me, here? Councillor, Councillor John, Chair. if I can just intervene a moment, please. Thank you. If I may be helpful, Councillor John, the question I was put is, are the minutes accurate? If, if the minutes are accurate, then that answers the question that you're raising. I believe the minutes are accurate. Um, Councillor Brocklesby, if you confirm that, then I think we can move on. The minutes are absolutely accurate. That is an ambiguity, I would say, in that at the time, Councillor Chandler was a member of the independent group, and that's how it was meant to be read. And I will happily state for the record that the Welsh Labour Party group of Monmouthshire County Council made an agreement with the Green Party. We made no such agreement with any independent member. And you are referring here to Councillor Merrion. And that was the same reply that I gave to Councillor Kerr when he sent me an email uh, last week. Nothing has changed. So, uh, uh, can I have somebody do a... a, a, a Chair, yes, Chair, uh, importantly for the record, I think yeah. it's important to note that at the time, Councillor Howells was not a member of the independent group. By way of personal explanation. So, the minutes are accurate. Councillor Howarth. Yes, Chair. Can I just, uh, on a point of clarity, I was in attendance on that meeting, but my connection was quite poor. Um, I was in and out uh, for some time. So um, could you mark me as re recorded in them in that meeting for, for some time, please? Uh, I was in and out. I will agree with that. But I, I was present, um, and I can um, say that I, I was on camera for a short time. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Howarth. We can do that. Chair, I'd like to propose the minutes as an accurate record. Thank you, Councillor uh, Garrick and uh, Chandler. Thank you. Right. Um, move on to item six on the agenda uh, uh, for the Gwent Public Service Board Wellbeing Plan. Uh, I'm going to pass you over to um, Councillor Brocklesby to deliver that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, this plan that um, comes before you is part of a legal requirement for all councils and has to be approved one year after the council elections. We were granted a one year extension by the Welsh Government, so we must pass this plan today. Why it is a legal obligation is that the well-being of the Future Generations Act places a duty on public bodies to think more about the long term, work better with people and communities and each other, look to prevent problems and take a more joined up approach to what we do. We do this as ourselves, as Monmouthshire County Council, and we do this with others as partner in the Gwent Public Services Board. So this report is about our shared responsibility with the other five local authorities. Each PSB must prepare and publish a wellbeing plan setting out its objectives and steps it proposes to take to meet them. And this particular plan contains two wellbeing objectives which are described in more detail on page 12 and 13 of the plan. Firstly, we want to create a fair, more equitable and inclusive Gwent for all, and we want a climate-ready Gwent where our environment is valued and protected, benefiting our well-being now and for future generations. So you can see quite clearly, and I'm pleased um, by this, that there is a very good alignment between the priorities of the PSB document and our own community and corporate plan. 
and the two objectives are underpinned by five steps. I'm not going to read these out, but you can see that them in paragraph 3.5 of the covering report. Equally important is that the Gwent PSB has committed to becoming a Marmot region. This means that we will and are working with the Institute of Health Equity, led by Professor Sir Michael Marmot, to undertake evidence-based action to reduce inequalities in Gwent. Other Marmot regions include Bristol, Newcastle and Gwent, Manchester. I would refer you here to our community and corporate plan where we have also aligned ourselves uh, prior to this to the Marmot principles. The wellbeing plan as it presented here is not a finished article and I would at this point like to pay tribute and I'm grateful to the Public Services Scrutiny Committee because it's from their efforts of scrutinising the um, wellbeing impact assessment which is not a statutory obligation but is a necessary evidence base. It's from their efforts to query it and then to write to me um, expressing their concerns that from Monmouthshire we were able to widen the conversation with our colleagues across Gwent and develop and influence a, a far more rigorous approach to how we would take the plan forward and to start to reflect on the analysis of the um, impact assessment. And it, it's very much, I think, um, a really good example of where democracy at local authority works well, where scrutiny can help not only internally in our council, but helps how we can influence and work with councillors in um, councils in our region and more widely. So I, I would like to say thank you for the work that our scrutiny committee did. Because the issues that they had was that the plan was too generic. And this is important when you're trying to come to the specific uh, objectives and overall vision. I think I've talked now about where we are, but we're starting to recognize, not starting, that's what the conversation was about, what measures, what really matters for us as a region that we need to focus on? How are we going to message that? How are we going to collect the evidence? And more importantly, how are we, are we going to show impact on all our residents across Gwent? And that's what shifted the conversation because of the work of our scrutiny committee. I'd like to particularly thank uh, Councillor Armand Watts and Councillor Penny Jones for the work they did in taking us forward. So, the other four councils in Gwent already approved this document ahead of the final decision. It would be detrimental to the work that has been done by our scrutiny committee, by the work since then, and by the, the whole of uh, Gwent, of delaying the endorsement now and it would create a number of logistical problems. We have to recognise that we are one partner among many and I would stress here again, um, we agreed at Council in April as part of uh, endorsing the community and corporate plan that we would always strive to be a good partner and I think this is about good partnership, being willing to take the journey together and involve ourselves in difficult and sometimes fierce conversations about what plans should look like and how we should implement them and how we should monitor them. So our preferred approach is to continue to develop this work once the plan has been approved in line with national timescales. Officers are confident that it is in progress and on this understanding, I recommend the plan to you for approval. Thank you, Council. I'd like to invite any comments to the plan. There's nothing on the screen yet. No, I'm just going to do a second. It looks like technical today. <laughs> 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 
we're just waiting for the for the the, uh, the setup to come up on the screen. So we'll take comments in in that order then. Okay, uh, Councillor Neil. Uh, thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Leader. I, I understand the uh, reasons that are largely presented for the plan, but they did sound extremely apologetic um, uh, that there is a timeline that we need to meet, uh, after which the plan will be turned into something that presumably we would actually wish to support. Um, I must say that the plan itself, as it's currently described, uh, is, is so much motherhood and apple pie. Uh, it's very confused. Uh, it has, has practically nothing to commend it as a plan. And it felt like a document that um, Jim Hacker might have been reading in Yes Minister um, as I worked my way through it. And then I realized um, by the time we get you know, halfway through it, we enter Mao's China and the great leap forward, Kirka 1965, where we talk about healthier, more equal, cohesive, vibrant culture, resilient, globally responsible, globally responsible and prosperous as um, very clearly aspirations with absolutely nothing underpinning any of them. It then becomes so wooly that I swear several moths flew out as I got to the last section. And the plan overall has just one major failing. It is not a plan. A plan must demonstrate actions that can be taken within set timelines. It's not a plan if it's something other than that. So it certainly shouldn't be called that. It's an assort assortment of aspirations and good things that we might all say would be nice to have, but there's nothing actually about it that commends it in any way as a plan. So it begs a whole series of questions, not, not least of all how much money has been spent um, wasting time getting to this point. But what is the administration doing with this jumble of thoughts? And could we please either turn this quickly into a genuine plan which should come back to council and clear to everyone, including our residents, because I defy anybody to look at this and understand what it is that we or any other council might do by when, so that we can actually be clear about the outcomes, be clear about the actions, and that they are focused and that there are follow-ups on it, so they're not simply identified as things that would be good to do with no follow-up. And if not, why don't we just file this one away alongside the first three drafts of the corporate and community plan, never to be seen again. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Neil. Um, uh, move to uh, Councillor Watts. Yes, Chair. No, I'd like to um, approve this plan, obviously, because uh, you know the committee that I chair have, uh, have looked at this twice, um, and if you look, uh, we uh, we weren't entirely happy with, I guess, you know the overall scrutiny, really, or, or the kind of detail of scrutiny that went in from. Uh, I guess our partners, our local authority partners. Um, it's unfortunate the terminology, Chairman Mao, is that really necessary to apply those terms uh, from some kind of totalitarian regime into something as a, a democratic process? It's a low blow uh, even for this councillor. So I, I'm not going to rise on that too much, but I, I think that it has the outline of, of this plan looks substantial. Uh, it is obviously it's aspirational because it's, it's early stages. So I would hope that the council would pass this plan. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Watt. Some other indications? Uh, no more indications to talk. So we'll move to a vote. Oh. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, Councillor uh, Brocklesley, you'd like, like to sum up. Thank you. Um, thank you for both contributions. Um, Councillor Neil, um, you seem to have forgotten that this is a report that's being put together across the whole of Gwent. And uh, as I said as in my opening remarks, we have been robust in trying to um, influence and turn this around. Um, Monmouthshire has done its best um, through its officers, through scrutiny, uh, through myself, 
to influence the way that we go forward uh, on a, a process uh, the public service boards as you will know have had a mixed history in Gwent um, since they were first brought in under the uh, Wellbeing and Future Generations Act and our aim as a as a a council under this administration is to give teeth to this board and we all know the way you give teeth is to stay with the process stay with the process as a critical friend and that's why I gave so much gratefulness to our scrutiny committee because that was one of our levers to go back and say we need to think more about this and we need to think differently and we need to be focused you're quite right there are flaws but as we said and let's pass the plan as it is now and let's ensure that we remain active at all levels in ensuring that it comes to a plan which will make a real difference to citizens in the Gwent region of which we're part and I would stress once again that's the nature of being a good partner to be vocal about what's wrong, but also stick with it to make changes to, to make it work. And I would um, urge all of council to vote um, to pass this plan. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Brocklesby. Um, uh, Councillor Jones, uh, I see that you've uh, um, requested to comment after the summing up. Uh, um, are you sure? I, I will allow it if you want. Oh, thank you. Thanks. We'll move to a vote on this. Thank you. That's been carried, thank you. Uh, moving on to item six, sorry, seven, uh, the Chief Officers Children and Young People's Annual Report. Uh, pass you over to uh, Will McLean for that. Thank you. Good afternoon, councillors, and uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the first thing to say is thank you for the opportunity to come and present uh, my annual report to you this afternoon. Um, it's always, uh, I hope and I think, an important uh, part of my year uh, to be able to, to present to full council where I think our education system is, um, the risks that remain, um, the achievements we've seen in the year, um, and the way in which the team has worked to achieve those. Um, I think the first thing to say, and just for everybody's reassurance on a slightly warm and stuffy day, I'm not going to read through the 79 pages of the report. I'm not going to turn the pages of the presentation, um, but I did want to take this opportunity um, to reflect on some of the themes as they emerge in the report um, and some of the other points, I think, which may uh, benefit from a little additional clarity. Um, you might potentially see, as I've uh, written the report, that uh, in terms of how we frame things, uh, an alliteration is always a good thing, uh, as far as I'm aware. So today, I'm going to talk about, a little bit about the content of the report. I'm going to talk about the context in which we are working, the clarity that we now have in terms of how we take this forward, the capacity, capability, and competence of the team to achieve that, the challenges that remain, and then I will draw some conclusions. And I will try and do that in a timely way for you all. As I said, 
The report is longer this year than it has been previously, um, but I did want to have the opportunity to share with all members the depth and the breadth uh, of the work of the Children and Young People's Directorate. And it's a directorate that supports our children and young people um, through our parenting services from prenatal time right the way through to the uh, kind of 25 year olds who we work with still under the new ALN legislation. So it's a really significant impact that we have on children and young people's lives. So in terms of the content of the report itself, it falls into what I would describe as four main areas. There's a contextual element, there's a reflective part on how well we've achieved in the last year, there's a part which is hopefully informative and describes the impact that we've had uh, in our services, and then there are the conclusions that I referred to earlier. Of course, I'll be happy to take any questions that councillors have um, on anything in the report or anything related, um, whether it's said or not said in the report itself. I think for transparency, just two areas that are not explicitly in the report this year and just to why that's the case. In the past, I've offered a commentary around safeguarding, but given the uh, proximity of Jane's report into safeguarding and Jane's chief officer's report, which will be coming in the autumn, that felt like it was best place for Jane to place comment on. And the second thing I haven't done is to include lots of data around compulsory examination outcomes. Uh, many of you will be aware, I hope, that we're actually not um, supposed to aggregate um, or share or use those um, examination outcomes in a way that's kind of publicly or potentially used for accountability. So rather than kind of beginning just to show you national level trends, I thought we'd withhold those. This summer, the summer of 23, um, Welsh Government has agreed that we are going to be able to use um, the CAP9 score again. So we are, in the autumn, I'll refer to those and you'll be able to get a sense of how your four secondary schools have performed um, across that examination period. So if I move on to the second of the Cs, and I won't come back and repeat all six of them, but just to talk a little bit about the context in which we're working. And I think the first thing to say is that the context will be different for each of the 35 settings in Monmouthshire. No school is um, the same as another school. Um, in each of those classes, pupils will have different experiences, the teachers will have had different experiences. So the context in which we're working will be different, potentially subtly in some cases, but it will be different for all of our learners and all of our settings. In the presentation, and I think on page 51 of the public pack, um, there is a slide that talks about um, a system that is both moving and evolving, and I think that's a fair representation of where we are. Of those four interconnected circles, the two I'd like us to talk a little bit about um, are the return post-pandemic um, and the reform agenda. So if I can just touch a little bit on those. I think what's really important when we consider the impact of the pandemic is that the pandemic has an impact um, on the adults in schools and the children in schools. And in essence, both parts of that system have moved. So not one part remained the same for the other to respond to. Both have actually changed in that period of time. And that's something really difficult um, for both parts of that to come to terms with. So as we worked our way through the pandemic, as people's personal experiences happened, um, as their expectations happened, we see a different response when we return to school. And that's really important for us to be aware of that. I think in terms of expectations, um, there have been significant changes. Pupils' expectations of how they learn has changed, and for many of our learners, they experience a different type of learning which might have suited them better. For some members of staff and some of our school teams, their expectations of work have changed, and that's been a pressure as well. So the application, the expectation, and the energies in schools have all changed on both the staff and the pupil side, and we need to be aware of that. In terms of reform, um, and on page 56, you'll see the six elements of the, um, our national mission, the strategic document from the Welsh Government. You will see and have a sense of the breadth of the reform agenda that's taking place in Wales at the moment. And 
every single one of those reforms has an impact and an influence on every single one of our settings. And they are significant reforms, reforms to the curriculum, to examinations, to our provision for students with additional learning needs, to how we close the attainment gap, to how we think about well-being, to how we think about relationships, um, sexuality and education, to how we think about religious um, education, to how we think about the development of Welsh, and on Windrush day to day, how we think about creating an anti-racist Wales um, by 2030. These are really significant pieces of reform right across um, the education um, environment. And they're all existing alongside that pressure of returning to school post-pandemic, but also returning to school and being in school with a really heightened sense of expectation from ourselves as senior leaders and also from yourselves as councillors, as wanting to have the very best service that we can for our children and young people. So those two significant pieces of context also inform how we work with our schools and how we gain an understanding um, of what is happening in our schools. And that has changed significantly from the first time that I stood and presented this report in 2018 uh, to how we do that now. I think I make reference in the report to 2018, it being a 26 slides of a detailed analysis of how children performed at the expected level, the expected level plus one, how boys did, girls did, children eligible for free school meals, a huge amount of formalised data was available. Post-pandemic and actually pre-pandemic, the Welsh Government made a decision to move away from that, um, that data being used in a very, very driven accountability um, type way. So we now look to understand what's happening in our schools by observing, by seeing, by partaking in the evaluative activity that schools themselves do. We begin that process, what we call our professional discussions, and then we work with the schools, with our colleagues in the Education Achievement Service, through a whole host of school-based activities. Learning walks to understand what's happening in the classrooms, book scrutinies to make sure that the books are capturing the effort and the progress of children. We talk to our learners and we talk to our leaders in our schools. And that collective endeavour, that collective intelligence, allows us to form a picture about the quality of the evaluation that takes place in schools and the quality of the improvement planning that flows from that improvement work. But it's not only in terms of school improvement that we are able to see what happens in our schools. Within CYP, we have a host of colleagues who are on the front line working with schools on a daily basis. Our colleagues in the educational psychology team, in the ALN team, in the specialist teaching support team, in the education support team are all out working with our children on a day-to-day -day basis, as are our education welfare officers, as are my colleagues in the finance department and those colleagues who work to support the government that exists in schools and on governing bodies. So that's how we now get an insight into what's happening in our schools. You'll have seen reference throughout the report to what is ASOS, the action short of strike, which is currently being undertaken by the National Association of Head Teachers. Um, it now has a very different meaning to me, other than the slightly uh, the, the online um, fashion retailer. It now has a slightly uh, more difficult connotation. Um, but um, it is proving a challenge for us, because our ability to get into schools in a very structured way um, is not as easy as it was. Since that started on the 1st of February, it has been a constraint, and I think it would be remiss of me not to recognise that. But that's not to say that we aren't able to work with our schools. And where schools reach out for support, where they need that help and guidance, we always are there ready to provide that. The third area I just wanted to touch on was around clarity. Um, I've mentioned the national mission. That was agreed on the 21st of March this year and published by the Minister. A little um, under a month later, um, Council here agreed our community and corporate plan with at least um, that key priority of a learning place focusing our attention. And within that, those four key areas of improving attendance and reducing exclusion and removing barriers to learning, to finding the benefits of the new curriculum through excellent teaching and learning, creating a truly inclusive education system that recognises pupils' starting points, their strengths and their needs, and commits us to continuing our school modernisation. Between those two key documents, we now have the structure, 
and the direction that we need to be able to deliver, to be able to really identify what we believe our su success factors will be, and to be able to hold um, our colleagues and ourselves to account, but also critically for you to be able to hold me and our directorate to account for what we achieve. So as those two significant pieces of work have formalised and crystallised, we're now be being able to, to populate our plans with a far greater level of granularity and detail than we had been previously. I think I'd just like to take a moment to reflect um, on the three aspects of capacity, capability and competency. Um, I think it's important for you to understand how well placed I think we are to deliver your aspirations for your communities, and in particular, your children and young people. Clearly, and I hope from my um, input so far, you'll understand that it is a challenging context for our schools um, and our provision at the moment and our settings. CIP is a very small part of the organisation. We have 78 members of staff in our directorate, um, but 31 of those um, work directly um, for Flying Start um, and the Acorn Centre. So they're partnership projects with Anar and Bevan. Um, they work in very specific areas. So when we take those aside, um, because they're not involved in that core work for some of us around the schools, uh, it's a team of 47. And that team of 47 are supporting over a thousand members of staff um, who work in the schools. So our ability to have a significant impact is one that is always um, tempered to a certain extent by the capacity of the team. It is and it always will be a challenge for us, but we work very effectively as a partner. And I was taken by the leaders' comments around how they work as part of the PSB. It's been one of the key things that we've sought to do is to make sure for our key partnerships that we always um, work as the very, very best way we can to be the very best partner to get the very best outcomes for our children young people. I don't see any benefit in trying to erode or negate the benefit of partnership in those workings. So with our colleagues in the EAS, the Education Achievement Service, in a, with the Naira and Bevan, with the, ed, with the Education Autism Trust, we will be working with them as closely as we can to maximise the value that we can from them. And I really believe that as we do that, we will achieve more from our investment in those partnerships. Our capability as a team is strong. We've recruited really well in the past couple of years, um, and I think we now have a team that is really values-led, it's really driven in terms of wanting to achieve the very best for our children and young people. Um, they work really well in what are offering, what are often very challenging and um, environments where there can be quite a lot of tension. When you're talking about the needs of individual children, you're trying to balance that against the whole class, between what you want to achieve for a young person, that can be a difficult place for professionals to be. But because they do that from that perspective of the child being at the centre and having that value, they work really well to overcome that. If you see in the, the presentation, I think on page 49 of the, the pack, there's a, a diagram that looks perhaps a little bit like a, a trivial pursuit uh, kind of uh, piece of the board, um, but that really captures that importance of the child being right at the centre of everything we do. Everything else wraps around the child, and that's vital. In terms of the competence of the team, as I said, we've recruited really well and we've got a team committed to professional learning and committed to actually developing their skills in best they can to make sure that we can advocate always for the children and young people in our county. Beyond the broad contextual pieces, there are some specific challenges that face our service at the moment. The return from COVID and its impact on staff and pupils has had some significant impacts around attendance. Um, you'll see that in the report on slides 83 to 84, around the number of children who are choosing to be educated at home and around the level of exclusions that we're currently seeing in schools. Much of that is driven by the complexity of the cases that are coming into our schools. One of the key areas we're seeing is a very heightened level of anxiety amongst our learners, our 
learners and our young people. And we're having to respond to that in different ways. So one of the key things we've done is created and really enhanced and developed an intervention which we call EBSA, which is around emotionally based school avoidance. So where those children really didn't feel able to return to school post pandemic, we've had to set up specific interventions, guidance, and in one case, even a very small class provision to try and get those children back into school to make sure they're comfortable and are ready to engage in their learning again. That anxiety can also drive other behaviours. And one of the things which we are seeing is an increase in the behaviours that challenge. And that's really important for us to be aware of. We're seeing this right across Wales. And when I'm involved in discussions with directors, both in Gwent and more broadly across Wales, we see this being one of the key challenges for schools as we have come back post-pandemic. It's very, very difficult. But... And on the flip side of that challenge, I really do believe that the new shape of the team, um, the collaboration we see across our inclusion services, means that we're now better placed to support our schools and our learners respond to those additional needs. With regards to how we look forward and how we think about um, planning for the future, that is a challenge for us. Um, we know that um, we have work to do on our um, catchment areas. We know that we don't have equal growth potentially across the county, and that has the potential to cause some challenges in terms of where our schools are, how they're distributed, um, and the capacity that our schools have. You'll see sites in the report around some of the surplus places that we have, and how we manage those is important. It's important because we want to make sure we're as efficient as we can be in the delivery of the services. The capital works that we envisage going forward um, are in a good position, so those schemes which are underway I think are developing very well. Um, you know, hugely significant is the investment in Abergavenny and the new 3 to 19 school. For those schools still on the books, um, which and the development still on the books, um, the pressures that we're seeing around um, the finances, inflationary pressures, make, being able to secure the right types of contractors are proving a real challenge for us in terms of delivering those new um, developments in the future. And of course, the cost of living crisis has had an impact on all of our learners. Um, and in Monmouthshire, we haven't been immune to that. Um, we've been doing lots of work recently with the EAS and with other organisations across Wales um, to make sure that schools recognise and understand those challenges for our learners. So some of those can be very easy steps forward, not expecting everybody to come to school dressed in fancy dress on World Book Day, um, not expecting people to wear their football kit on certain days, actually just being really flexible. Odd sock days are a great way of involving everyone having fun but it doesn't cost those additional things and we've seen in the past um, research done by offices in the authority that parents have to make really difficult decisions about what they forego um, to enable their children to go to school and participate. It's a continuing challenge for us um, but we've been working closely with the AS and their tackling aspects of poverty scheme to make sure that we address that and colleagues within the organisation as well Ryan and Lisa work really hard with our schools to make sure they understand those pressures in the classroom for our learners. And then finally, those challenges that remain working with our schools. I'm very fortunate we have a fantastic cadre of head teachers in Monmouthshire, um, but the industrial action at the moment is making that more difficult. Um, I can't dress that up any other way. Um, as I said, when they come to us, when they want help and support, we will always provide that. But some of the more developmental agendas aren't as engaged with as they might have been. So in terms of the conclusions, the purpose of this report is to provide you with a level of assurance as to where the education system is in Monmouthshire. Because of that ASOS piece, I haven't been able to provide the level of assurance that I might have been able to in the past. But in terms of our schools and in terms of the performance of our schools, we've seen a definite improvement in the trajectory of the inspection outcomes that we've seen over time. I think that's really positive. We do have two schools in a statutory category. Um, we're working very hard with colleagues to make sure that they are coming out of those statutory categories at pace. We're working with partner schools to enable that to happen. But the more recent inspections, the last 11, we've seen a definite upward trajectory in terms of the findings of those inspections, the number of cases studies identified by Estin and the good practice. 
As an authority and as a service, we have strengthened our ability to support our schools, our ability to go alongside our schools, our ability to support learners in schools, and I think that's been hugely important. Alongside that, and in that reflective part of the report, you will see that the commentary is largely positive against the, uh, the aspirations and the ambitions of last year. There remains work to do in terms of the recommendations uh, from our ESTIN uh, report. There has been a significant intervention between the publication of that report and where we are now in terms of the pandemic. So actually, how we understand excellence, how we drive for excellence, how we push for that, changes in light of some of those factors. We're working very hard in terms of the FSM and closing the attainment gap, and we're working hard to make sure that our um, ability to evaluate our own interventions is strong. So, two final points, one around risk. Schools face a continued risk. We all face a continued risk around adapting to change post-pandemic. That has to be recognised. Schools see the reform agenda as positive. We see the drivers that it's seeking to create as positive for children in Wales and bringing about positive change for children in Wales. But it does bring a weight of expectation onto the schools and their organisation's shoulders. The continuation and the potentially the long-term continuation of industrial action is clearly a risk to us. And it would be remiss of me not to recognise that there is resource pressure within the system. And that's on many levels, be it the recruitment of staff and the retention of staff um, or the funding of schools directly. The funding of schools directly from the local authority, but of course the sustainability and the long-term um, allocation of grants from central government. But in terms of drawing this to a close, you'll probably be glad to hear, from a Chief Officer's perspective and from my perspective, we're doing absolutely everything we can to work really hard alongside our colleagues in our schools to make sure that the services that we're able to provide to support the children and young people who are of your families, of your communities, are best placed to achieve an excellent education that develops them from whatever their starting place is to whatever they are actually fully able to achieve. That has to be our commitment. We'll work as hard as we can with our partners to make sure that we are able to be, I think, one of the foremost educational settings in all of Wales. I think that has to be our, our ambition, and we will continue to do that for you and on behalf of you. Many thanks, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Chair, are we taking questions, or are we taking them through the uh, list of names? Uh, list of names. So, uh, Councillor? Greg was first. Greg was first. Thank you, Chair. I'd just like to take a brief moment as the Cabinet Member for Education to thank Will McLean for that very detailed, very informative report. Uh, there is a statutory duty for him to submit a report that could be one page of the very briefest detail. What I think as members of this council we've received here is a detailed look across the whole range of where we are, starting with Flying Start and going right through. So thank you very much, Will, and to your senior leadership team who I'm sure have had some minor part in putting this report together as well. Uh, you comment in the report that it's been a couple of years since you've stood and presented one of these to us, and it's probably worth reflecting for a moment what an, a, an, a dreadful couple of years that's been. Uh, there has been a pandemic, there has been a, a financial collapse, there uh, has been a cost of living crisis. At the same time, in strictly educational terms, it's been a challenging two years. A brand new curriculum for Wales, a brand new system for looking at additional learning needs. As the Cabinet Member for Education, I feel very confident that we have got a grip on all of these steps forward. 
and that your guidance from both yourself and your senior team to schools and to us as elected members has been clear and helped us to see our way through the difficult times that uh, w we have been through. So very many thanks and congratulations. Uh, I look forward to working with you for as long as the leader thinks I'm worthy of my position in the cabinet. But thank you from a politician's point of view for the work you've done in raising the standards, the achievements for all our people in Monmouthshire. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Crook. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I noticed recently uh, research has identified that we have um, some 25% of our pupils in poverty, which are certainly impacted by this, but also that Monmouthshire has some unique characteristics regarding inequalities in small localised communities. I just wondered, are we truly addressing these issues through the provision uh, you outline in your report, to be honest? Thank you both. Uh, first of all, I start with Councillor Groker. Thank you very much, Martin, for your kind words. And uh, yes, it was remiss of me not to recognise the contribution that the team has made in terms of both bringing the report together, but also their contribution over the past period as well, um, which has been really hugely significant. And uh, I'm very grateful for all of their work. Um, in terms of uh, Councillor Crook's question, in terms of the, the poverty and the impact of poverty, it is hugely significant. 25% um, uh, of our population um, live in poverty. I think that's between, up to 60% of the median income, I think, is the measure for that. Um, and that's something we have to be acutely aware of. One of the key challenges for us in education has always been that... Um, the, tradi the traditional measure of disadvantage has always been your eligibility for free school meals. Um, but what we're seeing now is a population who are disadvantaged through their economic circumstance, which is far greater than those who are simply eligible for free school meals. And we have to be aware of that population in the classroom. In the report, um, there's a series of... Uh, pages which identify um, some of the challenges that we have and some of the ways we're trying to address that. One of the key things we're trying to do is recognise that there are different interventions that exist at different stages um, along a child's journey to school. So what can we do to support children at home? How can we provide that support so that we minimise the impact on poverty at, the, at that level? What can we do in the community to help them? How can we bring them um, into the community so we can make uh, resources more available? and so on. Then as we come into school, I touched a little bit around the, th the, the aspirations of tackling aspects of poverty programme that which we're running. That's about how schools can create um, a, an agenda which is very, very clearly driven by the highest of expectations, but it recognises every learner's starting point and tries to provide a level playing field for everybody to develop from. But not a level playing field which simply brings everybody up to one position, one that actually recognises that some will actually need additional help and support. And there's some really good learning from some of our schools. Uh, Castle Park in the south of the county um, have been involved with a, an intervention for a long time called RADI, Raising the Attainment of Disadvantaged Youngsters. That's a brilliant scheme which really seeks to tackle um, some of those inbuilt perceptions um, and disadvantage that children come to the classroom with. So there are a range of different things like that that we can look to use. There's also recently been a Welsh Government um, Commission, which is a, a broad um, development uh, set of tools that all teachers can use that help support disadvantaged learners in the classroom. I think really interestingly, the, the key to that set of interventions is that if you use them successfully, all learners will benefit. It isn't simply a matter of focusing on those who might be um, disadvantaged. So yes, it is hugely important but we're absolutely committed. It's been an issue for too long, in my perspective. You know, I think I've been talking about it for too long, so we really need to find the means by which we can make a difference in that agenda. Thank you. Uh, going to Councillor uh, Eason. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Will, for the presentation. I've got two short questions, Will. Um, since I've been a councillor, I've always had a concern about the flying star provision because... 
housing developments have meant that people have moved from flying start postcode into a non-flying start postcode so that they've lost their ability to um, stay in the scheme. And I noticed that uh, flying start is going to be extended to take on all two-year-olds, which is very good, very good. I'm pleased with that. I don't know whether you can make a comment on on the development of that and how it will apply in Monmouthshire. The second question is, um, it's on page 76, I think, is to do with the provision of teaching in um, in the Welsh in, in the Welsh schools. Are you concerned about retention and, and getting teachers for the Welsh education service that we provide? Can you comment on those two um, matters, please, Will? Uh, well, are you okay to do it in groups? Yes. Uh, so we've got, we've got quite a few to, uh, councillors wanted to speak, so we'll do it in a few groups. Thank you. Uh, Councillor uh, Neil. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Will. Uh, just to say I think it's a, a, a really excellent report and I really appreciate the amount of work and detail that has gone into it. Um, the very, very clear commitment that, that the Council has got, that you've got, that the team have got, to make sure that the very best can happen um, from our young people, they are, they are our future. Um, uh, some minor um, thought, um, I struggled slightly with some of the acronyms, and there might be uh, room for an acronym reference at the end, um, particularly on page, uh, it's on my page 55 where it references ELSA. And when you started mentioning EBSA, I was beginning to lose it. Um, I'm not sure if it's a typo or if it's just something I need to brush up my learning. But um, I, I'm the chair of the Audit Risk and Assurance Committee for the um, Educational Achievement Service. So I'm really very committed to the, uh, the, the work that goes on right across the partnerships and um, very specifically in, in education, which could not be more important. Um, I grew up in, uh, in, in poverty in Glasgow, and, and uh, one of the best, I guess, like a, a number of um, colleagues in the, the room today, and one of the, the very, very best gifts that I had from my comprehensive education in, in uh, Glasgow was um, resilience development. Uh, the uh, the knowledge that where I was at that point didn't define where I needed to be at any point in my life, and the uh, development of um, self belief and the uh, aspiration to develop and improve, um, and it seems to me that there is a really useful potential addition to this report in terms of the development of resilience in our school age children. Um, it's extremely important that those children who need support get the support uh, that they require and the disadvantages of economic or uh, learning needs, additional learning needs, social, uh, family, health can be so extraordinarily challenging for young people, people of any age. But the greatest gift that I think our schools and that we as, uh, as communities can give to those young people is the belief that they can actually achieve and aspire and the knowledge that they can overcome those difficulties. And I would really um, ask you to consider the development of um, a section that specifically looks at the development of resilience in our young people. Thank you. Thank you. Just take one more uh, from uh, Councillor Strong. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Will. That report was very detailed and uh, interesting to read. Um, I'm noting um, on page 69 um, it, a really good example of some of the sort of new things that have happened. And since January 2022, you mentioned sort of partnership working with the Autism Educational Trust and also the National Autistic Society. Um, what do you see as the main advantages of this joined up partnership working and how would you want to further develop this if you if you would like you know like to in the future
Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, so I'm picking Councillor Eason's up first. So Flying Start is hugely important. Um, we know all of the research um, about the first thousand days. Um, I think it potentially um, it, it's, it has the opportunity to, to really make a, a vast difference to, to children and young people's lives. Um, I think it is really positive, um, the way in which Flying Start works here. I, some of you might have met Beth, who's our Flying Start manager. She is uh, a force of nature. Uh, the reference in the report to me being told off on more than one occasion that children don't uh, aren't born when they start school um, is from Beth. So uh, she's a constant reminder that Flying Start, how we support families in their very early days, will make a really big difference uh, later in their lives. So yeah, we're committed to that rollout to the over uh, for the two-year-olds. Um, it is a a frustration around the limitations of the postcode um, and we have to be conscious of that but in working with Flying Start and the Acorn service alongside each other we do try and create as much flexibility between those two services as we can to make sure that as many people as we can access the service so we're trying to be as flexible as we can in that provision. Um, I'm really grateful for the question around um, the development of um, the the WESP, in essence, the Welsh and Education Strategic Plan, and how we are able um, to attract and retain um, staff um, for the medium of Welsh. Um, elected members in the chamber will be aware that um, it is a challenge for us. Um, we are quite remote. We don't have um, a, a kind of a natural um, kind of basin where there's a high level of uh, Welsh uh, spoken, um, and that makes it a challenge compared to other parts of Wales. It just means we've got to work harder to make sure that we recruit those teachers. We've got to think uh, flexibly about how we do that to make sure that the settings that we have, so currently a school of any and a school of theme, are really attractive um, to our members of uh, the teaching profession to come and work there. Um, and as we develop, and we'll see the new uh, seedling school, hopefully, we're out to final statutory notices at the moment, um, how that develops, and I really hope that we're able to do that. It's a really valued and valuable part of our education provision, um, the Welsh medium element. And uh, I hope that uh, in line with the aspirations of the West, we can see that develop uh, in the coming years. Uh, turning to Councillor Neil's questions, um, I think resilience has become very, very apparent um, as, a, as a key need for all of our learners, um, driven, um, no doubt, by the pandemic, um, although I'm sure it was always there um, to a certain extent. One of the things which happened with the pandemic was that it, it impacted everybody, and I know that sounds potentially like a silly thing to say, but it impacted everybody in different ways. So there was no... Um, apparent and obvious delineation. So there was a focus clearly when we met here as councillors around our provision for families who might not have had the economic resource to buy the IT kit necessary to be able to learn at home and so on. But equally, there will have been learners at home who had two parents at home, who were expected to work throughout, who might have been on laptops in different parts of the house, who weren't able to find some of the time to support their children in their learning that other families were. So it impacted right the way across our communities. And what we've seen is that in returning to school, that resilience need is right the way across our groups of learners as well. I think there's a huge amount that we can do to support our learners. Having our schools set the very, very highest expectations so all of our children have an absolute belief in what they can achieve and an absolute commitment to achieving that and making sure that our teachers never, ever underestimate that, that perpetually that's the expectation. When I sometimes go to feedback sessions from Eston when schools have been inspected, that's the thing I always look to hear. You always want the inspector to say that the school has the highest expectations for its learners. That's a vital thing that we hear in those sessions, and I think that's really important. For me, I think resilience, um, it's really important that we don't create a kind of a separate piece which is about resilience. I think resilience can be developed through really excellent 
excellent teaching and learning in the classroom. So the children gain that sense of um, learning, they gain that resilience through their learning. If I think we create things which are additional to, then there's a risk that when we have periods of financial constraint and so on, they can be minimised and mitigated. So I think we've got to recognise that across all of our learners, there has to be an incredibly strong base position where children, um, through their learning, get that resilience, they get the sense that they try things, they test themselves, they develop. Our teachers' marking and feedback to them helps develop that but also having that expectation that outside of the learning environment, um, there are things they can do and how they respond to it. I'm really interested in the notion of character education. I think that's something which we should look to. Um, and recently, myself and Ian Saunders, in terms of uh, uh, Mon Life and its provision, have been looking at different ways we can support some of our learners who are vulnerable uh, to exclusion and at risk of exclusion. And that's through different ways, using our amazing outdoors, using our amazing um, Mon Life, Life instructors to actually build their resilience and their self-confidence. So we are looking at that in that broad way. Just in terms of the, um, uh, in terms of some of the abbreviations, um, there was a little bit of vanity that an acronym or an acronym, an acronyms page would have taken me well over 80 slides, and I was trying to res resist that. Um, so just on clarity on those two, ELSA is a emot emotional literacy support assistant. So we'll see um, ELSA's work across nearly, I think, all of our primary schools. Um, there's normally one or two. And when children are experiencing periods of dysregulation um, or just things are proving to be a bit challenging for them, whether that's at home as they come into school, the ELSAs are really well trained by our educational psychology service to have a set of skills and approaches that just take those children, settle them and get them ready for the school day. It can be an ongoing relationship. So that's our ELSAs and our EBSA is the emotionally based school avoidance, which is that which has been driven by uh, the anxiety that we've seen increase um, from the pandemic. Um, and finally, of these uh, questions to Councillor Strongs, um, uh, of all of our growing demand um, for children with additional learning needs, um, autism uh, and uh, the children who are on the neurodevelopmental spectrum um, are the most significant. That's the area of growth we're seeing most significantly. So the work we're doing currently um, with the Autism Education Trust and the National Autism Service um, is a pioneer in Wales. Nobody else has done that. We're using our Welsh Government ALN grant to fund it. It's got a huge opportunity. We're starting um, with our special resource bases, which are our bases for um, children um, with much more complex needs, to develop those into centres of excellence. As they develop that skill set, they'll be able to, to transfer those skills into the mainstream schools. So that's the model which we're seeing. Uh, and it was really positive. Um, Mawena, Dr. Mawena Wagstaff, um, our um, head of inclusion um, sent me a note the other day saying that it had been picked up uh, by the CYPE committee um, in the Senate as well. So a really strong project and one which we wish to see in the future. Thank you. Next uh, is Councillor Stevens. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Will. I found that report really, really interesting. Um, just one very quick question. Um, do you think that the rollout of foundation stage universal free school meals and the promotion of breakfast clubs is having an, um, a positive impact on pupils' ability to learn? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Stevens. Councillor Thomas? <laughs> Good idea. Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks, Will, for that very com comprehensive report. And I, I, I appreciate uh, how challenging you know, the last few years have been uh, for schools and, and for the service. Um, I just want to make some comment on, on, on Welsh medium. I'm, I'm really disappointed, and obviously I'm on the, the Welsh Educational Strategic Plan Group, but I'm disappointed that the opening of the Seedling Welsh School in Monmouth, on Monmouth itself has been delayed. It's not going to open now in September 23, as, as many parents hope, and certainly um, Rhieni Drosadis Cymraeg, the Welsh medium parents for education, had hoped. The funding was actually allocated in 2017 uh, in the last council when Councillor Martin Grokert and I started in this council. We're now in 2023 and, and the school hasn't opened. And I, I, I certainly hope there will be some movement there now over the next year. And certainly, in my opinion, the key factor 
is the establishment of a Kilch uh, a Welsh medium play school in Monmouth this coming September to feed into the new school so that that school uh, is able to open with sufficient pupils uh, in September 2024. The other great concern that I have, and many parents who have children in primary Welsh medium education, is the fact that uh, in MCC we are the only authority in Wales, out of the 22 authorities, uh, we haven't got a, a Welsh medium secondary school. We have to send them out of county. And certainly when I was on uh, an S4C Any Questions programme recently, uh, pupils from Ascolgav in Gwynclew spoke really eloquently about the long journey times that they experience. Some of them travelling over an hour and ten minutes each way, uh, start, end of day, uh, two hours and twenty minutes in, in a bus, uh, even for a secondary school pupil, is too long. And it does affect uh, the energy that they have to tackle the full school day, do their homework when they get home, uh, and also then revision when they're older, in key stage four and in A level, to do exam revision. We really need, and I'm asking really, you know, what are the plans uh, in terms of the establishment of a Welsh medium secondary school in MCC? I know it's going to be a tripartite agreement, and that's going to be more difficult to plan, but it's out in the ether. Um, people are asking me, well, when is it going to come? And, and the reality is there's a huge bleed, there's a loss of pupils between the two very successful Welsh medium primary schools, a school of Fien in the south and a school of in, in Abergavenny. The bleed is happening very much due to the long travel times. People do not want to put their kids on, on the bus uh, for hours on end. And in reality, if we want to solve the problem of Welsh medium uh, teachers and staff, we need to have a Welsh medium secondary school. Because if you look at a school giving Gwynllu, many pupils there have gone on to teach or to become teaching assistants or, or admin officers or whatever because they have the fluency in the language. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Councillor Wright. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just looking at the Eston recommendations, and I can see that there are a few areas designated amber. And I know you've, you've already touched on additional learning needs and reducing exclusions, but I just wonder whether you could maybe give us some more detail around the progress that's being made uh, in the other areas. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so Councillor Stevens, first one. Um, I think every school should have a breakfast club. I think that's a hugely important um, aspect of, uh, of how we can engage our learners um, as early as we can. It means that they're set up well for the day. Um, members in the chamber will know we've been through several kind of cycles of discussion about how we charge for them and so on for the childcare element but that ability for children to always access a free breakfast irrespective of whatever else has happened to them that morning to arrive in school early to have something to eat to settle to be with their friends before they start the school day is absolutely vital so um, I think we're, we are very nearly there and I very much hope that in the, the coming academic year we will get to being 100% in terms of um, that provision vision. In terms of the universal free school meal rollout, I'm hugely uh, kind of indebted to my colleagues um, who work in Francis' directorate and to Deb Hill Howells, who's been leading on the rollout of that. Um, we've successfully rolled it out to all of our foundation phase learners this year, so they're all able to access a free lunch every day. Um, we will be looking um, to roll it out completely. So we're kind of really pushing as fast as we can um, to all of our schools um, in the, uh, to all of our learners in key stages, foundation phase and two uh, from September this year. So, um, and again, you know, there can be arguments around whether universal provision on that scale is the most cost effective way of managing uh, things. And when we started the debate, it was uh, potentially looking at changing the threshold as opposed to a universal offer. But I think that universalism um, with regard to that, those children engaging 
eating together, I think is a really positive thing. So hopefully both of those um, will roll out effectively now. And, uh, you know, it's an area not without its challenges in terms of recruitment um, for the um, uh, for the service itself. You know, we've had to step up and there's probably been a doubling of demand in every school. Um, so that has been an area of work for us. And as I say, I'm very grateful to the support that uh, I've received and our schools have received from colleagues elsewhere in the organisation. Um, to answer Thomas's questions around Welsh, um, so yes, we were equally disappointed that the uh, satellite class to be provided by our scholar theme um, was unable to go ahead uh, in September 23. Um, it was a difficult decision for us to reach, um, and it wasn't a decision that we took lightly. Um, and but I think on balance, it was the right decision in terms of where we were at that time. Um, what I hope very much is that following the publication of the statutory notices and their closure just before the summer recess, um, we will be able to come back to Cabinet in the uh, autumn um, with a very clear recommendation to proceed to establish the Seedling School um, in the, uh, for September 24th. That's not intended to prejudice that decision in any sense, um, but that's just our aspiration for trying to achieve that for the Welsh medium sector. Um, your point around the money being available... Um, the grant funding from Welsh Government has been available for a couple of years. Um, it has proved a very challenging um, setting to try and create. Um, you know, we have moved through a very range of different considerations, which we all at each stage thought were viable and proceedable with, um, but each one has been challenging. So I think the, uh, the final position which we reached, which we now rest on, which is over mono, I think is a really good one to go forward. Um, the challenge which I referred to earlier around the, uh, the school places and so on, we will have to now think about in terms of the replacement LDP, in terms of developments in our towns, to understand how else the school estate and the school provisions might change going forward that will accommodate um, more Welsh learners in the future. Um, and to your point around um, secondary school provision, um, I think this is one which we have rehearsed several times. Um, I think it is... It would be um, an ambition to have a Welsh medium secondary school within Monmouthshire. Um, at the moment, and even at the end of the WESP, the number of Welsh learners... Um, my concern would be that they wouldn't be sufficient numbers of children transferring from the end of Key Stage 2 um, into Key Stage 3 to have a school of sufficient scale to have a broad curriculum offer. So that's one of the concerns. I understand uh, your concerns about, um, as you define it, the bleed um, from Welsh medium into other schools. Although, interestingly, on balance, I think we're seeing more children now um, attending Welsh medium secondary schools than we have in previous years. So... Um, coming September, there'll be 27 children transferring to Welsh Medium. Um, two years ago, it was only 24. So we are seeing growth in that sense. Um, so we are working hard. There is, as you say, a tripartite relationship. So we're working with colleagues in Blyna Gwent and in Powys to understand this kind of heads of the valleys area uh, and if there's the potential there for a Welsh Medium solution um, for children of a secondary um, age. Councillor Wright, your questions around our Eston recommendations. Um, I think um, it's an area whereby I know I will always have, because it's a, it can be a fairly fraught experience being inspected by Eston, I will always want to do more. I will always want us to achieve more. And as I hopefully conveyed at the end of my opening comments, I want us to be at the absolute forefront um, of education provision in Wales. And in order to do that, we have to tackle the recommendations that they left us. I think as we went into that inspection, um, we knew those were the areas that we had to work on. And it was a, a really positive experience to have that validated, that our evaluation ourselves recognised that. So I think in terms of the work we've been doing um, for children with free school meals, um, I think we're beginning to make good progress there. So in some of those Eston reports, I talked about that kind of the improvement in terms of the, the reports that we're now receiving. There are explicit statements that children eligible for free school meals make good progress. And that's really important to see that and capture that. The generic work that we're doing across communities, families and schools to improve their awareness of cost of living and to that broader understanding of what the impact of deprivation can be will accelerate that as well, I hope. 
In terms of the standards piece, which is this piece around, you know, I think broadly and colloquially, you know, we have fantastic youngsters in Monmouthshire. We have fantastic youngsters from families who come to school really ready to learn. And we should be able to do an awful lot with the rich kind of resource that enters our schools um, when they start school. So we need to be expecting them to achieve the very, very best. So some of the language around excellence, when we were inspected, there were summative judgments in Estin, and they talked around, you know, you'd be expecting, you know, standards judgments were excellent and so on. Some of that's fallen away now, but we need to look in more detail to make sure that our teaching and learning, the progress of learners, isn't just good, it's excellent. So it's remained amber because we've got to keep pushing for that. The ALN one, um, because of the way the ALN team have come together um, into a new team, I've marked that as amber because we are, through the summer now, we'll be developing our inclusion strategy, which will be a very broad um, um, strategy that will really bring together those four elements. Um, so until you see that, until you see and get a sense of what that means and how that feels, it feels wrong to say that that's green. So that's why that one remains amber. And the evaluative piece, um, we are having to change the way in which we understand our system, the way in which we understand the service and the impact. So that's remained amber because as we're doing that, as we've been in the pandemic where there was a paucity of information, as we're now in ASOS where there's a further paucity, um, we now need to think differently around that. Hopefully those models that I referred to earlier in terms of how we engage and understand um, you know, the way that schools are working, the depth and the understanding they have of their learners and their provision, that will help that. So that's why that one is there. So I will always err on the side of caution. I'm confident that we're in the right direction, but there is work to do. Uh, thank you, Will. Um, uh, moving to Councillor Pavia. Yeah, thanks, Chair, and thanks, uh, Will, for the report as well. Um, I, I do have some questions, and some will probably be more straightforward than, than others to respond to. In terms of the development for our schools and planning for the future, I, I welcome the Chepstow Cluster Review, uh, and, and that's underway. Um, will either yourself or the Cabinet member give assurances that local councillors will be engaged in the process and um, that will that we as local councillors will be able to see the results of the review of ahead of any formal publication? In terms of the material condition of the school estate, I note on page 67 you provided the, the grading condition of the last survey in 2019. Can you tell me when the next survey uh, process is, please, as there are likely to be some of those 19 schools who probably slip from band C to band D category, and I think we need to know as a council what the capital investment trajectory for those schools could look like in the future. In terms of the legacy impact on COVID absenteeism, and I, and I think I've said this in this uh, in the chamber many times, the disproportionate impact of the pandemic has had on our children and young people it will take many, many years to unwind and mitigate. And, and the figures of children missing education are concerned, and particularly amongst that um, free school meals uh, cohort of pupils. The levels of anxiety and poor mental ill health and wellbeing have increased considerably, particularly in our secondary schools and referrals for educational psychologist intervention and for child and adolescent mental health services are, are up. And I think given the lack of capacity within the NHS in relation to CAMS, it, it does seem like that uh, all local authorities are doing or able to do um, and manage the impact of, uh, of assessment delays. Um, the longer the delay, the more challenging and complex the individual circumstance becomes and the wider spectrum of statutory uh, support that is required, and it just becomes a vicious circle. Chief Officer will know that following the incident in Caldecott a couple of years ago, a bespoke piece of research work was to be commissioned, working with multi-agency partners to understand the particular circumstances in that school community around mental ill health. Was that work completed? And, and if so, is he able to share the findings with councillors uh, potentially in a, a closed workshop setting? And given the com complex challenges in some of our other secondary schools, uh, is he or has he considered further community reviews to to really have a careful examination of the issues at play in each of our school uh, localities? In terms of the increase in elective home education, um, can the um, officer give the council assurances that all pupils that have fallen out of uh, mainstream system for whatever reason have been identified and on, uh, on the authority's radar for follow-up and support? 
uh, I note uh, recently the guidance issued by Welsh Government regarding uh, uh, EAG, uh, and does the Chief Officer believe that the guidance provides um, his team with the sufficient advice to support children and families who are being educated at home? And I'm particularly thinking about those robust measures that are required to quickly identify when a child is missing or potentially missing education and to follow that through, uh, the, particularly the tracking process. In terms of um, the, the Estin report, I'm obviously really pleased to see the overall positive outcomes following the recent inspections and uh, you know, all those schools should be congratulated. I'm particularly pleased with the strong performance by St Mary's Catholic School in Chepstow where I'm a governor. I think the case study there uh, regarding how it it has developed its uh, Welsh language provision and culture and what is probably one of the most multicultural schools in the county is something I would recommend colleagues to look at and the, the video can be found on Estin's website. But how it's developed its proficiency right across the school, I think links to the council's strategic objectives in Welsh, uh, in its Welsh education strategic plan and those points are from page 72. The school has really strong aspirations to be the first bilingual Catholic primary school in Wales and I know it wants to follow up a positive report with Welsh Government and our officers to see how we can meet the objective uh, to be that, that first uh, Catholic school, but also to help the council achieve its objective of developing a Kilthmythrin in the town. And, uh, and I would agree with what Councillor Judah Thomas said about, about um, uh, Monmouth as well. I think that's really, really important. You know, I know it was really disappointed. I was probably as disappointed as the, the cabinet member not to see the the seedling open in September for for this year. Um, I, I you know I know it's not uh, the the issue uh, around um, the, the the council and the work that it's put in and the engagement work that it's done with it, its education forum members. Mm -hmm. The issue around sufficiency of supply of. Uh, 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 in relation to Welsh medium teaching workforce is of concern, particularly in this part of Wales, and I think that's been uh, addressed. Um, you know, I know uh, the we've had a number of cabinet uh, visits uh, in the county over recent uh, months uh, and over the last year, and I think the, the education minister was in Chepstow just last month. Has um, the chief officer and the cabinet member in particular uh, because it's obviously a, a policy piece. Has he communicated with the minister that the urgency of some flexibilities that are required in the Welsh in education workforce plan to enable this locality to attract, train and retain educators in the Welsh language? Uh, and finally, Chair, um, in terms of the corporate plan and wanting a step change for, for schools in their entirety, and I say in their entirety because you've got educators, governing bodies, PTAs, to focus on mitigating the impacts of the cost of living crisis and material disadvantage. And I don't disagree with the objective and principle. However, I think there's an issue here for me around capacity. And, and well, I think you highlighted in, report, in, in your report, particularly at the end of the report, some of the risks and challenges um, that are at play. Uh, particularly about embedding reform, increased concern around school budgets. We obviously got a, a, a workforce, a leadership, particularly a leadership workforce, who are unhappy with pay terms and conditions, national pay terms and conditions. Yet we want our schools to develop strategic action plans and to to embed in their school development plans the, the, the need to tackle pockets of local poverty and deprivation. So I'm just trying to square the circle where is the capacity and resource to do this in a meaningful way you know not just as a, as a tick box exercise for governing bodies to 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 do after governing body meetings but to do in a really meaningful way thanks chair thank you councillor fabio uh, well would you like to take that yeah. there's quite a few questions should be yeah. yes i will yes thank you uh, and thank you councillor fabio for the questions as well of course um so in terms of planning for the future um uh, absolutely without hesitation um, we would like councillors to be involved in fact i think for the primary school catchment review there's a meeting on monday morning i think um hopefully councillors will be aware of that um and able to participate um so absolutely um we have commissioned um um, through a member of our team, Tim Bird, who was formerly the senior deputy head at Monmouth Comprehensive School, a learning-led review um, in terms of what the potential is for change in Chepstow. Um, so Tim is um, spending a lot of time in Chepstow with the children and the staff. He's taking them to different schools, looking and thinking about what could be possible um, from a learning perspective and what they want to achieve in that way. So we're certainly looking to do that. Um, and 
you know, of course, we will look to engage all councillors and relevant stakeholders in that as we take it forward because it's really important. Um, of course, as well, we're going to have to balance um, pot potential changes around the um, the LDP, the impact that might have, all of those things uh, have to be taken into account. So yes, but absolute commitment to that. In terms of the pressures um, that so very clearly exist, uh, you're right to recognise the increasing in the, um, the levels of demand for um, those services um, to support children and young people's mental health and well-being. Um, again, this notion around tiered approaches, so the work that's been undertaken to embed the whole school approach to mental, emotional health and well-being um, is that the kind of the base level of that, that's from what we're going to build. Um, we're seeing um, continued pressure on CAMS and I'm sure, I hope Jane would agree that that remains a, an area of significant uh, pressure for Anira and Bevan. Um, we're trying to work um, in a really collaborative way. So two of our educational psychologists um, work part-time for us and with Anira and Bevan and their Kinevin um, intervention, which is the, the piece around uh, well-being. So we're getting that advantage in terms of their input and their knowledge, which are able to share across both settings, which I think is excellent. So completely recognise that. One of the, the points for me is that when you hear about episodes which certainly to me sound really very significant and can be quite extreme. The waiting times for CAMs on the back of those are still very long. And actually we really want to see in partnership how can those be mitigated down uh, and reduced. Um, the work around um, the wellbeing issues uh, in the school in the south of the county, um, I would be happy to share that. We've had some work done on a regional basis um, by one of the task and finish groups, which I think we'll be able to share um, in a closed way. Um, we're also continuing to work with the school to make sure that the learning environment um, is both entirely safe, as you would clearly hope um, and expect, um, but also that the space and the environment can be used as it was designed to be used. That's the other really important thing. Um, with regards to the recent publication uh, of the new guidance for uh, those children who are electively home educated, uh, we're working through that now. Uh, one of my former colleagues, Richard Austin, has been on succumbent to the Welsh Government. He's been contributing to that. Um, we have a grant from Welsh Government to support our work with EHE, um, and we receive very often really positive feedback from those families about how we work with them. It's not guidance that doesn't come without risks. Um, the risks are in there around expectations around ALN and so on. So we have to be very conscious of those as, a, as an organisation. Um, but we're working through that at the minute. And no doubt that will come back into uh, the democratic arena for consideration in the future. Um, you are absolutely right, uh, Councillor Pavia, to, to praise and recognise the, um, the tremendous steps that have been taken in St Mary's in terms of their approach to Welsh. Um, really very positive. I did speak to the, the lead inspector um, who did say that he'd been in one lesson and thought that it had been delivered trilingually, that there had been Welsh, English and Ukrainian uh, all in play at the same time, which I think is remarkable for, for any uh, educational setting. So clearly they've really embraced that. Um, I think one of the things we need to do is to look and think about the ambition of St Mary's but also the ambition of Chepstow Comprehensive School in terms of its capacity to develop um, its Welsh medium. They've, been, they've recently recruited some fantastic members of staff and there's a real ambition there and we have discussed that um, with the, the Minister as well because as you say he's been in contact a few times over since the new year. Um, I think with your final point with regards to capacity, um, it is always going to be a challenge for us because we are a small um, organisation, we're a small team. So we've got to find the ways in which we can best leverage as much support and capacity into our schools. Um, we need to make sure that the interventions that the schools run are meaningful and mainstreamed into the schools so they don't feel like additional tick box exercises. We've got to make sure that they absolutely commit to making sure that, that closing the gap is fundamental. Um, I think for the NAHT, I think if uh, if they were answering that question, I think they'd probably say that their concerns are broader than paying conditions uh, and we're working with them uh, through Welsh Government to try and understand those concerns uh, and to find a way through that because I really think that if we're to achieve what we want to achieve, we have to be able to work very closely with our schools um, and any barrier needs to be taken away. I hope that helps. Thank you, Will. Um, we'll take three more questions and then we'll have a short break, if that's okay. So, Penny Jones, Councillor uh, Jones. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Will. Uh, a, a really good report. 
Um, uh, I was just carrying on uh, about, we've noted already that uh, educational psychologists play a really important part in pupils' lives. Um, but there is a shortage, and I wonder how, uh, how um, severe this shortage is and how it is impacting on the pupils um, themselves. But also, likewise, in Flying Start, there's a shortage of dedicated health visitors, which is having an impact on how they can work. And this is um, obviously through ABUH, I'm sorry, Anarin Bevan University Health Board. And um, I was wondering how much influence you have with them. Do you meet with them? Do you have a say? I mean, we have invited them to the Public Services Scrutiny Board so that they can, uh, committee, sorry, so that they can, you know, um, perhaps tell us why there's this change. But it really is having an impact on Flying Start itself. And as you know, that is so important to our young people, not to seven. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Councillor Thomas? Uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Davis. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Will, for the detailed uh, presentation and report to, to Council this afternoon. Um, I'd like to ask a question, if I may, on uh, on funding, and specifically the funding settlement uh, for our schools here in Monmouthshire. Now, it's my understanding from engaging with the most recent Welsh Government uh, statistics that this county historically uh, has been one of the most underfunded local authorities in Wales. Uh, and in fact, Monmouthshire has been one of the lowest per pupil, uh, or rather has, has had one of the lowest per pupil spending levels of any local authority uh, across Wales. Indeed, the most recent data uh, implies that Monmouthshire spends £6,630 per pupil. This contrasts, as I'm sure you're aware, with a Wales average of £6,773 per pupil. And when we as a local authority contrast this with neighbouring local authorities, these figures are even more uh, unfavourable. Blaine Gwent, for example, uh, had the highest spend per pupil of £7,397 of the 22 Welsh local authorities. Uh, even neighbouring Torvine spent £7,091 per pupil. So can I therefore ask the Chief Officer and invite him, if I may, to comment on the extent to which the financial settlement from Welsh Government compounds the financial challenges facing this local authority and indeed the challenges facing our school setting and our young learners across Monmouthshire. And turning briefly, if I may, to the Welsh language, may I also associate myself wholeheartedly with the comments of Councillor Tudor Thomas and Councillor Pavia. I think it's deeply regrettable that this administration, seemingly at the 11th hour, uh, reneged on its commitment to establish a seedling Welsh medium school in Obermono. And as the Chief Officer's own report recognises, there could be further delays still to the establishment of a Kilch Maithrin, a Welsh medium nursery provision uh, in Monmouth. Now, I'm, I take some heart from the response provided to both Councillors Pavia and indeed to Councillor uh, Thomas, and I'm sure advocates of the language, myself included, will take some comfort from, from those words of reassurance. But can the uh, Chief Officer perhaps provide a bit more context to the conversations that he and his officials continue to have with the Kilch Maithrin here in Monmouthshire? Uh, and put on record that uh, his officers remain as committed as ever to continuing to strain every sinew uh, in support of nurturing a thriving Welsh medium nursery provision across the county of Monmouthshire. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Davis. Uh, Councillor Watts. Thank you, Chair. I won't be straining any sinews in this question, but what I will be doing is... Um, Asking questions about obviously the heightened level of deprivation, as you know, my ward Thornwall and Bulwark, uh, Thornwall as it was originally, um, has a um, fly and start scheme, a very successful fly and start. And without making a speech, I'd like to play tribute to the staff um, and that enterprise. Really, it's a fantastic uh, achievement. And I noticed from the select committee meeting that Penny talked about the public services um, select committee that, that they are looking to expand um, and I think that's really important because you know the the extension of poverty into more rural areas is becoming more prevalent um, as austerity bites even deeper than it did um, 18 months ago and and so my question is about then 
are there some noticeable indicators that startle you, Will? Is this a you know, honest question? I know I'm, I'm looking for a, not an officer's answer, but a kind of a, an honest answer, your, your personal overview of how austerity is affecting the, the families of, um, of Monmouthshire and how that impacts then on statistically and how that impacts on then the, the performance of those children. And particularly about the, the CAT test as well. I, I, I'm really interested in those CAT tests, but I, I don't necessarily believe that they, they are the be and end or what's your views on that? And, and can I just say at the end of it, uh, being on this authority a long time, listen to you make a lot of presentations. Um, some have been better than others, but this has been an excellent one, if you don't mind me saying. So I don't need to get too big headed about it, but well done. Thank you, Chair. So, thank you, Councillor Watts. Uh, Will? Yes. Yes. Could I make a point of order? Can I raise a point of order, Chair? Uh, yes, Councillor Lees. Um, I'm, I'm concerned that the question has been put to the, the, the... Sorry, I'm concerned that a question has been put to the officer, which has, which has political undertones, and I don't believe it should be answered in this, in this forum. Uh, Councillor Eason, if it's okay, I'll respond. Uh, Will is experienced enough to know where he can go and where he can't go. So um, he'll he'll be guarded where, where it's appropriate to be so. Thank you, Chair. Okay. So, um, Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, so just to pick up, I guess, on, uh, starting with Councillor Jones' question. Um, yes, on both of those key professionals, um, there are patterns of challenging recruitment across Wales. Um, I'm really pleased to say, with regards to the Educational Psychology Service in Monmouthshire, um, they are, uh, touching wood, um, bucking that trend. Um, I think through, I have to say, the leadership um, of our formerly our two principal educational psychologists, now our head of inclusion and principal educational psychologists, we have been able to attract very, very high quality candidates, um, sometimes from neighboring authorities, um, sometimes from England, um, who have come, they've brought great experience, that flexibility of working across an Iron Bevan and MCC has been a great help as well. So um, on the EP side, that's positive. Um, I understand from my engagement with Beth that it is much more challenging with regards to an Iron Bevan. Um, and I think it's a very fair Fair point um, from yourself in terms of our engagement with them, and I think it's probably an action that I need to take away to uh, up the ante in that space and uh, uh, make sure that we are as fully engaged and as lobbying as hard as we can to make sure that we get the, the staff because it's such a vital area of work for us. So, um, a very, very fair point on both of those. Um, to Councillor Davis's points, um, I think one thing which I should have said perhaps earlier where whenever I hear feedback which is both uh, can commends me for detail and comprehensiveness. I always feel a little bit worried that that just means uh, undue length. So um, apologies if that is the case. Um, so with regards to the funding, Monmouthshire has... Um has a pattern of funding its uh, education to the greatest amount that we can. And we go through a process of budget setting every year in which we afford um, our schools the greatest level of protection. And as I work, walk into that process with my colleagues, uh, both uh, at SLT and in um, uh, on the cabinet side as well, um, I'm very clear about what our schools need in order to be able to provide the educational services um, for their learners. Um, I think looking Looking at the funding in isolation um, is potentially um, uh, can lead to some conclusions which aren't necessarily fair because if you look at the demand as well, you know the learners who come to schools in Monmouthshire often come. Um, they come from a very different kind of environment. What they begin school with is very different to some of the learners um, who will be coming, starting schools in Blind and Gwent and so on. So I think recognising the cost of addressing some of that deprivation uh, needs to be uh, taken into account as well. Um, with regards to the Welsh language piece, um, Absolutely. So in terms of the, um, the Kilkmythrin, uh, certainly within uh, Monmouth, then we committed very clearly in the public consultation events we had that we would do all we can to make sure that that is established. Uh, my colleague Sue Hall, who's our early years manager, is working all the time to make sure that uh, we get that established as soon as we can. It isn't um, easy, and that point that Councillor Pavia made about workforce um, was absolutely fundamental in terms of the, the Monmouth uh, 
uh, Mithrin. Um, a member of staff who was working in the Welsh medium setting um, left to go to an English medium setting. That's the kind of pressure that we have. And because of the, the numbers of Welsh speakers who are appropriately qualified uh, in childcare and so on, you can leave very vulnerable. So that single point of contact or single point of failure um, is, uh, is significant in that area. Um, but we are committed to that and it's absolutely critical to us making sure that the satellite, um, that the seedling school in 24 is a success and seeing that, um, that development of a pipeline of learners as it were um, is, uh, is, a, is a key part. Uh, to Councillor Watts' uh, comments, uh, first of all, thank you, Councillor Watts. Uh, I think I will take that as a compliment. Um, and apologies for the years which weren't so good. Um, um, in terms of deprivation, um, I think it's been evident right across Monmouthshire. I think in our schools, um, which have traditionally been um, very, um, have very, very low levels um, of free school meals, um, thinking about some of our schools in particularly uh, out in the rurality, you know, we're now seeing numbers which are probably into double digits. So we are seeing an impact right across uh, the county in terms of um, the impact, I guess, the legacy of the uh, pandemic, the impact of that on the economics and what we've seen more recently. It is bound to have an impact on all of our learners. It is bound to have um, an ability. It will mitigate their ability to come to school ready to learn. So all of those things around coming to school in a really um, present way so that you're able to learn and engage are affected. Um, if you don't sleep well, if you don't eat well, all of those things contribute to your arrival at school. Hence our real ambition to push out our reach beyond just the school gates, into communities, to get families to come into schools, to make sure schools reach out into their communities. One of the schools down in, uh, in uh, Chepster, actually, um, in Pembroke, have recently ach have achieved the reward or the award uh, in terms of their family and community engagement, which is fantastic. That type of work is the, are the building blocks for making sure that our schools are advocating and benefiting for the children um, in their communities. Um, in terms of the, traje the trajectory of um, the impact of um, the deprivation and the consequence of the cost of living crisis on academic outcomes, we're probably a little bit too early to be able to call that. The CAP9 that you refer to, and just for all members uh, to be aware of, and I think I did put this in the report, the CAP9 is the measure that Welsh Government will use this summer um, in order to capture um, the, the outcomes of learners. Uh, and the 9 will be your best English outcome on a point score, your best maths outcome, your best science outcome. So those are the core three. And then there are six other qualification slots. So your next six best qualifications go in there. And then I think off the top of my head, I think a B grade is worth 42 points. So, and they go up in sixes. So um, a, an A grade would be worth um, 48 and uh, an A star is 56, I think. I might be incorrect there. Um, and then you calculate the points. And ballpark, you know, in our comprehensive schools, we should be looking in excess of 400 for a points cap nine score. So that's the measure that will be used. We'll be able to share th those um, to a greater extent than we have done in the past. So that's at the behest of Welsh Government. And I look forward to seeing how our learners have done. They will have just finished their block of GCSE examinations and we look forward to seeing how they've done in the summer. Okay, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Will. Um, I, I think we'll all take a, a ten minute break now. So uh, get back here for five two five two four.
Uh, call, uh, can I call you to order, please, everyone? Thank you. Well, are you okay to take more questions? Okay, um, Councillor Birch, please. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Will, for the, that excellent report. Um, there's been an interesting discussion about how we foster uh, children's resilience. Uh, and I'm very glad that post-pandemic, uh, Mon Life and the schools have been working even more closely together so that all those children have the opportunities in sport, those things like the swimming lessons, outdoor education, um, and all those opportunities, because we know that when a child finds the thing that they're really enthused about, the thing that they are really good at, um, that excellence tends to spill over into other areas of their, their life. Um, and it was great to see the uh, the kind of life and leadership lessons that we saw uh, in the uh, play leaders conferences. So I suppose the question is, is there more that we can do in that area? And uh, while we're thinking about using resources to the full, is there more that we can do to ensure that school facilities are open to communities and indeed uh, children themselves outside um, the school term, outside the school day? Um, and I'd note that in the report, there's very little about post-16 education um, and whether you'd like to expand on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Birch. Councillor Fuchs. Thank you, Chair. So, um, again, thank you for the report, Will. Um, as a proud governor at Monmouth Comprehensive School, um, which we're all really delighted to have seen had an excellent Estin report, uh, report recently, I'd actually like to start by paying tribute to all our school leaders uh, who have performed amazingly well uh, in the face of such difficult circumstances in the last couple of years. Um, so I have a couple of questions and a couple of comments. So one, attendance um, I know is an issue at every school and comes through clearly in your report. So what measures are we going to take to ensure that um, we continue to work on getting that attendance back to pre-COVID levels? Um, also, you mentioned breakfast clubs, and at Monmouth Comprehensive School, the head teacher put in place um, a fantastic universal free breakfast club for every single pupil. And what he noticed, um, and I um, and the cabinet member for education had the good fortune to go around and see see it in operation. What we noticed at that breakfast club was an incredibly kind of quiet and calm start to the day. Um, and the breakfast club there really encouraged, um, he, the, the head teacher felt it really improved uh, attendance and good behavior in school, which I think is really interesting. So unfortunately that has been really difficult to maintain uh, and to continue, but it is something that I think we should aspire to for all our secondary schools if we can. Um, so the first question there was about attendance. My second question is, is linked to the breakfast club question. So difficult behaviours are rising. I hear both anecdotally as a parent um, of Monmouth Comprehensive and, and as a governor, and how can we tackle that? Um, final point around poverty um, and the cost of the school day. I was really pleased to see that uniform costs are being looked at and schools are being encouraged not to make it compulsory for branded items um, to be worn. And I think that's incredibly important that parents have an option um, there. So, yeah, that was it. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Fuchs. Um, uh, one more from, oh, sorry, Councillor Bond. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Will, and the team for all the great work um, that everyone's done during COVID and after, and the report. Um, something that I would like my question links and builds on, perhaps, something that you've said, Will, and also Beth Watkins and Sue Bryan previously, and Councillor Jones, and Councillor Neil, and Councillor Birch. So, uh, Will, you refer to the first thousand days being um, um, very important, but research suggests that it's even before that. So it's actually in the womb, obviously. Um, and we were just talking about um, emotionally based school attendance. Um, and my question is whether we can do things a little bit differently or do additional things. I've already spoken to uh, Councillor Groke about this. Um, Fly and start, we've heard about the problems they're having um, with the pilot and the um, and uh, helping young people because of the link or the lack of um, health visitors. Now, health visitors 
are very few and far between, even for, for normal situations. And um, new parents don't get any information about parenting and how to be the best caregiver they could be. So uh, really, um, well, and also before we were talking, uh, it's been mentioned about um, what Flying Start have been doing and proportional universalization, universalism, sorry, you, anyone can see that. Anyway, um, and it's and the point is that Flying Start is only for um, people of low income, which is absolutely commendable and absolutely right, but it's all socioeconomic backgrounds need help with um, parenting. And obviously, in the cost of living crisis, it's not just those low income; it's it's everybody that's suffering. So, um, so resilience was mentioned before by the um, councillors I mentioned, and the sense of self belief and esteem, esteem can be developed at any time. But of course, it's easier if it's developed before that. So it's if tackled and it's and then obviously a child doesn't go through difficult times and we don't see the bad behaviour that um, we've just um, Councillor Fuchs has just mentioned is probably on the increase. So is it possible to utilise this information um, and and perhaps um, um, involve it in relationship sessions in senior school to include good parenting? attachment attunement and the, for the caregiver um and also for flying start whether the health health visitors can be giving more guidance on i don't know whether they do but i know a few um new mothers and they haven't received it perhaps because there's not enough health visitors um to guide all about how to be good enough caregivers because i'm sure all of us would have liked that um, information as we became parents so it's really before people become parents but also think about it's not as you say well it's not um just when they become two it's before that so how can we um look at helping people be the better parents or caregivers and therefore help um, young people get the best start in life thank you thank you all yep Okay, thank you for the questions. Um, so to Councillor Birch in the first instance, um, I think I agree entirely that uh, any opportunity for a young person to flourish, um, be it in their academic work in schools, be it through sport, be it through creativity, music, dance, art, any of those things um, is of huge benefit. Um, we've come into that time of year whereby, you know, schools are tweeting out things like, um, you know, the GCSE art performances or the GCSE, uh, the work the artists have done. They are incredible. And I think that um, involvement of young people in those things which are so enriching is a massive step forward. And I think, you know, when you see young people involved in things which gives them that return, that the kind of... Um, you see them come alive in that. Um, and I think that's something which we've really got to try and uh, create more opportunities for. And I think the new curriculum in Wales will do that. I think that opportunity to learn through different ways, um, for us not to be um, so steadfastly just down a very kind of test-driven route, but one which is more flexible, uh, I think is a really positive thing. So I absolutely agree. And I'm really grateful for the opportunities that have been afforded uh, to our children and young people, the playmakers, that every year five-year-old, year five student, uh, in our primary schools goes through, you know, we've seen that set a platform for their involvement and engagement of developing their peers, working with their younger children right the way through. And the number of them who go from playmakers in year five to volunteering and then working in the youth service and the leisure centres, you know, is absolutely fantastic to see. So you see that investment uh, returned and rewarded later on. Um, I think, actually, I've got um, a view about the facilities piece. I think when we look at the Welsh government's um, communities focused school agenda it's absolutely right that um, that we support our schools be as open as they can be to their communities I think that is huge benefit both for the communities we are fortunate that our schools are well distributed across Monmouthshire that means that communities are able to access very good standard um, community facilities and I think that's vital that we do that this benefit flows the other way because when communities and families are used to going into school that breaks down some of those barriers so hopefully Hopefully families feel very comfortable in those school environments. That isn't always the case for everybody. And I think that openness between the school and the community is really, really important. 
With regards to the facilities piece, I hope that the community use the school facilities, but I also hope, um, and having attended a couple of events recently in the Borough Theatre in Abergavenny, is that our children and young people get the opportunity to use our other facilities um, as well. Because to see children on a stage, you know, in a proper theatre is brilliant for them. You know, to see them enjoy that, um, it's a very different experience to the school hall. So actually, we've got a, an asset base broader than our schools, and if we can use that in a really flexible and creative way so that all of our learners benefit, I think that would be really positive. So I hope that covers your questions, Councillor Birch. Um, to Councillor Fuchs's questions, um, yes, equally very, very pleased to see the outcome of the Estin inspection in MCS. Um, I think rightly positive and uh, to praise all of those involved. Um, in terms of attendance, it is a real challenge for us. It's a much, much bigger challenge in secondary school than it is in primary school. Primaries are back to about 91% now. They're probably 3% off where they were pre-pandemic, which was about 94. So we've seen a much better return at a primary level. Um, it's much more challenging at secondary. Um, and it's much more challenging for a range of complex reasons, I think, uh, in terms of people's experience. I think the mistransition um, between primary and secondary had a significant impact. That natural experience that children normally go through at the end of year six as they go up to year seven, um, where they kind of go through a very structured way of visiting the school, making new friends and so on. Because that wasn't there, some of those normal crutches that you have as you transition between those two settings weren't there. And so children will have been isolated through the pandemic and then find themselves in a very different environment. So that's something which we've got to look at. We are working very hard. I'm very grateful to Sharon and her leadership of the um, Education Welfare Service, um, which is led by Michelle in turn. You know, they're working in a really kind of in-depth way with our families. And one of the things we've noticed is that the thresholds, so when we talk about persistent absenteeism, that used to be at 80%. We're now seeing significant numbers of learners at, at attendance lower than that. And uh, it's really important um, that, we, that we work with those learners to bring them back to school to make sure they feel comfortable and are ready to learn. Um, that's the vital bit. So it's a, it's a whole piece that the schools need to work on. They need to work with us. And we've really got to focus on making sure that uh, our vulnerable groups come back to school as well. That's vital. And that was picked up in that, uh, the Estin report as well. So I think focusing on those key groups is, is critical. Um, I think the breakfast clubs um, for everybody would be fantastic, um, but it will not come um, at a, at a cost-neutral proposition. You know, I think uh, we've got to recognise that would be very expensive for us to be able to provide. Um, I think the evidence that was brought about by um, the head teacher in Monmouth being able to do that and the lessons we saw from that, I think, give us an indication about what we might think about in the future. We know, obviously, that the universal free school meal came about because of the uh, cooperation agreement between Plaid and um, the Labour Party at a national level. So how that future looks in terms of a different political um, aspiration elsewhere would be interesting. But certainly from a, a local level, that would be a very significant uh, uh, commitment financially for us. And uh, in our current climate, I can't see um, how we would get to there. Um, the you're right to recognise that behaviour in school is a challenge um, for all schools. Um, I have, over the past period of time, um, learned to correct my uh, language, so we'll now talk about behaviours that challenge, <laughs> rather than challenging behaviour, and they're, they're important nuances, I think, in terms of how we think about the adults and the children. And uh, I hope my earlier observation about, you know, both parts of the system changing, staff and pupils changing, has really led to a, a kind of of a crystallisation of a very different set of expectations of behaviours uh, in schools. And schools have to think very carefully about how they manage that, because there will be some leaders who look to step to quite a traditional kind of um, either reward or consequence model, and others will have a more relational approach to how we manage that. Um, I know it's something that many of you will receive correspondence about, and there will be people who are concerned about behaviours in schools. Um, we work very closely with our schools 
to make sure that they understand the benefits of both of those approaches to managing behaviour. Um, clearly, we don't want to see children excluded, be it on a fixed-term basis and certainly not on a permanent basis. Um, we want our children to be in our mainstream settings because the resources um, uh, and their chances, and we know this, when children are permanently excluded, are significantly impacted. So we're working really hard to make sure that we've got more resource. So things like the education support team, who have been recently appointed within the last year, they're there to go in and work alongside children and work alongside staff to look at model approaches to how we can support those learners. So hopefully we'll see that improve now over time. Um, and the cost of the school day, um, I think it's um, really important. I think the steps in terms of the change of the uniform, um, you know, obviously in um, Abergavenny there's a, a new school and they've been working through that process now and that's been open to, to kind of public consultation and public challenge and I think the school has responded really positively to that. I think making those steps, you know, blazers where you can iron on the badge or sew the badge on are really sensible things, not expecting all PE kit to be labelled up, really sensible steps that enable families just to keep that cost um, as low as it can. So yeah, I um, hope that addresses your questions. Um, and to Councillor Bond, um, the points around um, the flying start, yeah, absolutely. And I hope, I think in answer to Councillor Easton's questions earlier on, um, and to Councillor Jones as well, we need to work harder to make sure that um, uh, Anaya and Bevan are, you know, we're as close to them and they recognise that uh, sometimes there will be challenges in terms of that partnership development arena. It is a huge benefit um, to do that prenatal work and the ACORN project itself does do some of that parenting work um, for families and with families and that's one of the means by which we have to increase the coverage beyond the traditional flying start postcode areas. Um, and regard to resilience, I think at the basis of the resilience, um, a lot of that will be around relationships, um, about how pupils relate to one another and relate to staff and how they relate to themselves and how they think about themselves. And I think the new um, curriculum enables that, that sense of well-being being one of the core elements of the new curriculum should help us develop that. But uh, I think, and even in the break then, just listening to some of the discussions, I think that's one of the things which I'll take away from today is to think about how can we begin to develop some of that thinking around resilience uh, into the future with our schools. Thank you, Will. Um, Councillor John, please. Thank you very much. Um, well, first, Will, can I put on record um, our group's thanks to you for the way that you fulfilled your role? Um, as a former cabinet member for education, I've seen firsthand how you go above and beyond in uh, the way you support a federated leadership in our in our school system. Um, I, I think we're really fortunate to, to have you as our Chief Officer and the fact that uh, you've recently taken on um, a, a representative role amongst your colleagues across Wales I think is a, is a credit to the um, work you've, you've achieved. I think your report is candid, I think it recognises the successes, yes, but also doesn't hold back in fronting up to the challenges that our school uh, system faces, both locally and, and more widely. Um, I want to put on record our thanks also to, to your team. Again, I've, I've worked with many of them quite closely and I know how hard they work to support our, our school teachers um, and, and other school staff. Um, and I was also interested to hear the, the success of the, some of the structural changes that have been made in the team and the greater focus on, on inclusion that um, uh, you and Councillor Pavia led uh, last year. When one of the joys when I was the cabinet member for education was um, taking the time to visit the schools and I, I really enjoyed visiting every school in, in the county and seeing firsthand the, the impact that teachers and other school staff have and um, I mean, one, it reminded me that uh, I certainly couldn't do the role of a, of a teacher and it, it, it certainly emphasised to me the, um, I suppose the admiration I have for the, um, the, the fantastic work that they do. But we do need to recognise that the pressure on school staff has increased and expectations are much greater now coming out of the pandemic with the pressure to support children in catching up um, and um, I, I think all of us recognise that, that challenge and, and thank school staff for their efforts. 
I won't repeat points made by um, other members, but I, I will say I do agree with the point that was made earlier by Councillor Thomas about um, travel times being a, a barrier in terms of uh, school admissions. And I have to say, I don't think that will be helped by forcing pupils onto public transport, but we will be engaging in that consultation and we will see what recommendations come out of it. Um, I regret the fact that outcomes are not shared as widely as they have in the past for performance reasons. I do think it makes it much more difficult for uh, parents to make an informed choice about which decision, about which school to send their children to, and makes accountability and challenge more difficult. While we welcome the resumption of school inspections, um, I do think there are things that Estin could do to. Um, to give greater uh, assurance to... Sorry, Chair, is there, is there a question coming here? There's a response. Uh, Councillor, uh, there, there doesn't need to be a question. It's a, a response to the Chief Officer's report. Thank you. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you, Chair. Um, I do think there are things that Estin can do to give greater assurance to, to parents and others about uh, what goes on in our school system. And I do think the way they currently conduct um, school inspections does increase the stress and pressure on school staff. And I think there are things they can do to avoid some of that. Um, I welcome some of the contributions from the group opposite supporting uh, leadership in our schools. But I do regret that it isn't universal. Um, only in the past week or so, uh, we've heard the unprofessional intervention of several cabinet members engaging in megaphone diplomacy, criticizing one of our secondary schools and dragging their reputation uh, of a well-led school through the mud. I hope an apology will be forthcoming because the administration literally run this local authority, criticising a school in the press and signing a petition, calling on a school to pursue a particular course of action is deeply unprofessional. On our school estate, clearly we welcome the uh, investment that we initiated for King Henry VIII School, Ascola Veni, the new nursery investment at Trellick and Archbishop Rowan Williams. But I do want to hear more from the administration about meaningful plans for the future of Chepstow School and some of the primary schools which have been identified in the report uh, in, in grade C for the condition of, of the school estate. Um, we don't have much detail yet on the next stage of what Welsh Government used to call 21st century schools, um, but I wonder, Will, are you assured that we are going to be ready in time uh, for an announcement on that so that we can ensure that Monmouthshire pupils can benefit uh, to the maximum? I agree with the point raised by Councillor Stevens that breakfast clubs are extremely beneficial, and I do think it's, in, it's disappointing that she and her colleagues try to impose a £2 breakfast club charge. Um, I noticed assertions in the administration's corporate plan that the universal free school uh, meal policy will improve school attendance. Obviously, it's difficult to compare 2022-23 with previous years because we're just coming out of the pandemic. Um, certainly, if you take 18-19 um, to be the most recent comparable year, that doesn't show an improvement in uh, school attendance uh, in uh, either primary or secondary. Um, so I was wondering, well, if you have some views on uh, when we will reach a stage where uh, we feel that a comparison with 18-19 is, is meaningful in terms of, of school attendance, so we can draw some conclusions from that. I agree with the points you raised earlier about chasing excellence, including at key stages four and five, which are those critical years for uh, young people where hopefully they obtain the qualifications that will set them on a path to uh, a, a rewarding career. Um, under the previous administration, we encouraged greater cooperation between secondary schools, uh, particularly at key stage five, to maintain uh, the breadth of the curriculum. And I think that's particularly important for uh, some of those subjects that have a lower uptake, particularly um, courses like modern foreign languages. Um, so I've, I'd be interested in, in your views on what more we can do to make sure that that breadth of offer at Key Stage 4, but also Key Stage 5, is protected. So um, a, a couple of thoughts there and questions amongst them. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, thank you, Councillor John. Uh, Councillor Taylor. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just I, I, there's been a lot of speakers, and doubtless you're rather tired, Will. <laughs> but um, I'm just going to ask one question. Actually, I had a couple, but I'll stick to one. And it re it it relates to the matter of um, entitlement to free school meals um, and. In your report, you, you give a narrative which suggests to us that many recent Eston inspection reports indicate that um, learners eligible for uh, free school meals are making good progress. However, that's good progress, and you already talked around the standards piece and how that relates. So the other matter which you're uh, report points out quite clearly is that we don't have the aggregate data to, to understand exactly what the performance is like and whether indeed we are narrowing the gap and that is for both elected members and uh, officers. So what my question to you really is just simply how assured are you that when we do have um, some uh, attainment uh, data that we are indeed um, narrowing that gap between the performance of those entitled to free school meals and those who are not entitled to free school meals, noting the significant increase of children entitled to free school meals across the county and possibly significantly calling into question some of the um, understandings that people may have had about Monmouthshire in the past. Thank you, Will. Thank you, Councillor Taylor. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so to Councillor John's questions first, um, thank you uh, for your uh, kind words, Councillor John, and uh, for the work of the team as well, of course. Um, and you're absolutely right, to visit schools and to see um, our kind of our fantastic professionals working with the children in those schools uh, is always a joy. It's, uh, it's one of the very, very best parts of, the, of this job. Um, in terms of um, the outcomes piece, and I guess this talks to both your questions, Councillor John and Councillor Taylor's, um, the decision to step back from the publication of um, either at school level or aggregated to local authority level data publication um, happened pre-pandemic. So it was the direction of travel um, that was being followed. Um, obviously, it was then maintained because of the move to centre assessed and centre determined grades uh, in the two years of the pandemic. It was done, I think, with the very best of intentions because the concern was if you set a target um, and the classic one which used to be cited was the what was used to refer to as a level two plus, which was um, five, inverted commas, good GCSEs, um, that is to say a grade C or above, including English and maths. Um, schools <coughs> sometimes, and I like to always say and think that our schools didn't, you could lead to some practices, um, which I guess you'd describe potentially as perverse, um, for people chasing that boundary. You could end up putting your very best teachers trying to get children from D to C rather than B to A. So all of those kind of decisions in school were all unhelpful to actually seeing the whole cohort achieve their very best. So that's the reason why we've stepped back from that. On a, and I I don't remember if I referred to this earlier on, um, on a personal basis, actually some of that data was really, really helpful. And I hope, you know, in the early iterations of the Chief Officer Report, allowed you to understand where our system was in those days in terms of the achievements of our learners and young people. Where we are today is that when we talk to our schools, when we engage with our schools, especially the secondary schools, when we come back in the autumn term, We'll be talking to them about how their learners have done. We will be talking to them about the number who got um, the percentage who achieved A grades, the percentage who achieved five grades A and more. That's a, a really important one for us. We'll be talking to them at that level about their learners. So it's not that we don't understand that detail. It's not that we don't work in that way with the schools. It's just that the publication and moving away from that kind of the risk of it driving competitive behaviour is what was sought to avoid. So hopefully Hopefully that's why we've, uh, we've moved away from that. Um, coming back to Councillor John's questions, um, in terms of um, the Estin piece and in terms of the way Estin are working, um, I think 
I think schools would talk positively about the removal of summative judgments. Um, I think they would um, see that as a positive thing. I think one of the things which is interesting from our perspective is how well, and in the report you'll see that there's a, a one slide which picks up the quantifiers that Esther used, the most, many, a few, those kind of language how well that's been interpreted uh, in the wider public. Um, because we've seen some reports, which I think when I read them, I might be a bit, oh, okay, that's probably not what I expected that to be. And then you see a, a press report afterwards kind of extolling the brilliance of the school. So how people perceive and understand those reports is really important. I think the steps the new chief inspector has taken to make sure that there's a, a parent-friendly um, report which picks up the summative, um, kind of the overview at the front end with the recommendations is a good step forward. So I think Esten are trying to make progress with regards to that. Um, my understanding is that as we move forward, um, we won't have a ban C um, for the, what is now called Sustainable Communities for Learning, but there will be a rolling programme of strategic outline plans developed. So the work that we are currently initiating in Chepstow will be developed um, in light of that. Um, the other area, and just to, uh, for members to be aware that I think we're all looking at and just being aware of, is the increasing costs and demand, and it should be that way around, it should be the demand and the needs of learners and their associated costs for children with additional learning needs, and whether if those demands continue to grow, whether the development of a specific type of special school in Monmouthshire might be something that we have to consider in the future. So we, we are preparing ourselves for that. Um, as to whether universal free school meals will improve attendance, um, I'm not sure if it will necessarily drive attendance up. I think there are other factors which will probably contribute to a greater extent. Um, what I do know is an absolute bottom line is that attendance has to improve from where it is now. If we want our children to do well, the best place they can do to achieve that is to be in school uh, and to be learning with their contemporaries under the teachers um, and the leaders that we have uh, put in place to do that. Um, in terms of the, uh, there is actually a well articulated position, I think, in the community and corporate plan about us needing to look particularly about post 16, but also 14 to 19, in terms of having a broader um, and perhaps um, uh, a broader curriculum that offers more to more learners. And Tim Bird has been leading on that, and he's working very closely with the four secondary schools. And as and when that's ready to be um, shared, we will make sure that that does happen with all members. Um, to Councillor Taylor's final point around me being able to give an assurance um, about uh, what we'll see in the summer, um, that's very difficult. Um, uh, I suspect my uh, youngest would probably like me to be able to give an assurance about what he'll see in the summer, but uh, uh, I'm not able to do that. Um, I think when we talk to schools, though, I think there has been an absolute focus on moving those learners who are eligible for free school meals or who are vulnerable to get the very best outcomes they have. Um, it's an area which has continued to be difficult. When we look back over the two years of the pandemic examination diets, centre assessed and centre determined grades, when teachers themselves were the main um, factor in determining what the grade children achieved were, we saw the gap, the gap grow. So it's very interesting to see how that works through. So actually, now as we come back into a more formal uh, examination period to understand what the impact of that will be. So I think it's going to be interesting for everybody to see how that impacts us. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm conscious that um, Will's been up there for nearly two hours now, so um, we've got four more councillors wishing to speak. Uh, if I can draw the line under sort of uh, uh, Councillor Prind as the last speaker, if that's okay. So, um, Councillor Powell. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you very much, Will, for your comprehensive report, as good as any day. Um, it's really interesting to listen to it, and it gives us a lot of hope. Uh, mine's quite a short question. Um, with all children, uh, young, younger children, having free school meals, how are you going to uh, decide between them when you uh, rule how free school meals are doing and free school meal children are doing in their education, and those others are just happen to have free school meals? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Powell. Um, Councillor, uh, Councillor Chandler? Yeah, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, and thank you, Will. Um, I'm not going to praise your report. Enough people have done that. I'm going to praise your stamina. 
So uh, thank you for that. Um, again, I'll try and keep this brief. Um, uh, it builds a little bit on Councillor Fuchs's question about behaviours. Um, obviously, one of the objectives of positive education experience for everyone, when you talk about um, having places of learning that are supportive, safe and inclusive and free from discrimination and bullying. Um, I just wanted to extract a little bit more from you about how we're supporting teachers in this regard, because it is challenging, whereas it's relatively easy for a teacher to pick up on a school uniform transgression, because it's very obvious trying to pick up on an incident of uh, misogynistic or homophobic or transphobic language uh, and thing is, is a lot harder for teachers to be able to pick up on. And yet, at the same time, if we're going to have a safe environment for our pupils, we need to demonstrate a zero tolerance to, to that as much as possible, as well as, of course, the more physical aspects of, of bullying uh, and bad behaviour. So I just want to know a little bit more about how we're supporting our teachers and our schools across the board to, to tackle this issue. Thank you, Councillor Chandler. Um, Councillor Brown, please. Hi, uh, yes, thank you, Chair. I think um, a number of the points that I was going to raise have actually already been raised by uh, Councillor Taylor and Councillor Powell, but just asking about the preschool meals. I know that we're moving more from a um, less data-based and more qualitative assessment of um, schools, and uh, this was uh, orchestrated, I think, initially by um, the Professor Donaldson's approach to things. Um, I just wanted to know, though, that in terms of um, the fact that there will be universal free school meals, obviously it won't be possible to distinguish um, which pupils are um, uh, basically having free school meals or aren't. And I just wondered how you'd look at um, any gaps there as a result. And I was also under the impression, but I, I'm, I may be wrong, and perhaps you could tell me how um, the flying start system works. Because again, I think there was some eligibility criteria, and I think there is a concern about postcodes, because in, particularly in Monmouthshire, where we've got um, pockets of deprivation, and um, I'm not sure what the eligibility uh, criteria for um, flying start grants or support are. So really it was a question of, um, you know, how will you look at this um, in future in view of the lack of um, quantitative data and the fact that there's no uh, distinction between those who have free school meals and those who don't have free school meals because of the universal applicability of it. So uh, be interested to know how that will be worked out. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Uh, Councillor Bryn. Uh, my, thank you, Will. My question is very brief as well, I promise. Um, I admire the authority for issuing targets to increase the number of uh, staff able to teach through the medium of Welsh and provide opportunities for learners to uh, use Welsh in different contexts in their school. Can you tell me if there are also plans to liaise with other departments and organisations to increase the opportunities to use Welsh in Monmouthshire outside of a school context, increasing the children's confidence and ensuring that pupil, pupils realise the value of bilingualism and appreciate that this is a local living language and not just an imposed learning exercise. Dior. Great, thank you everybody. Um, if I can take Councillor Powell's and Councillor Brown's first question together. So um, this actually came up in the early stage of the discussion with directors. So everybody in primary school, hopefully from September, will be eligible for a free school meal. So when they come to school, um, there will be no cost um, for their free school meal. What will continue to happen is that um, schools will continue to work with their parents um, to um, apply, as it were, um, and to make, it, make them aware of their eligibility for free school meals in the old system, which was based on a threshold, I think, of um, uh, £7,000, I think, over the benefits threshold, I think, was the level um, of calculation. 
Why that is so important and why it is still absolutely vital that parents and families still continue to make those applications is that that drives additional funding for those schools and for those learners. So if the number of children in your school who um, are come forward and who are eligible for free school meals drives the allocation of the Pupil Development Grant, which is the money that comes from Welsh Government to support those learners in their learning uh, in school. So that's absolutely vital. The other part to that is that the other part of PDG, um, in terms of family support, in terms of uniform and equipment, is also driven by that application. So it's really important, and for any of you who are governors, um, to go back to your schools, it's really important to make sure the schools know that they keep needing people to register in that way that they're eligible. I think we're doing it as well through our benefit system, if we can, um, and again, that will hopefully help us, because it's the money that they benefit from in terms of the PDG and the families also benefit. Um, in terms of, um, Councillor Chandler, your question, um, you're absolutely right. Um, it is much more difficult to identify and pick up on those behaviours. And sadly, you know, I think we've all seen pieces in the, uh, in the press and, and sadly locally as well, whereby behaviours um, and attitudes um, are not where we would hope they would be and are not as welcoming and inclusive as we'd want to see. Um, I think we're beginning to see um, the benefits of some of the changes in curriculum. So the uh, relationship, sexuality, um, education work that's been doing, that's been established, um, that's led by Emma Taylor um, in Monmouthshire. And she's, Emma's great at providing that really good support to schools in terms of setting expectations, the type of resource they can use, how they can work with their children to really understand that. Um, the other area I just mentioned, it wasn't one of the areas that you mentioned, but the DARPA work. So DARPL is the Diversity Anti-Racism Professional Learning, um, is a national program. Uh, it's being led by Cardiff Met, I think, is the institution which is, uh, it's come from. Um, but that is a, a huge initiative and really getting all educators in Wales to think about their background, to think about their perspectives, to think about their privilege in a very clear way so that they are better able to understand the challenges that other people in their communities and in their classes might face. So I think that type of approach um, will hopefully, not only from the anti-racism agenda, but also in those broader issues, um, pay dividends there. But certainly the work that Emma's doing with schools is looking to support that. Um, Back to Councillor Brown, if I may, um, the flying start. Um, so that's driven by postcode. Um, there is a set postcode allocation. If you live in those postcodes, you're able to access the Flying Start services. As I've mentioned a couple of times, we try and be as flexible with that as we can be by aligning other services to it so that you can drift a little bit. Um, but it is difficult because it is driven by postcode in terms of funding allocation. It's a little bit like the old communities first, um, those kind of models which are clearly defined areas and have always proved um, challenging for us. Um, and finally, to Councillor Bryn, yeah, I think it's that's the way um, that we will make the difference to the ambition to be um, have a million Welsh speakers um, by 2050. Um, it's the achievement of that will be through our English medium schools speaking more Welsh, through our community speaking more Welsh. If we achieve 120 learners finishing Key Stage 2 um, through the medium of Welsh, that won't get us to the much broader ambition that we're looking for. So I think that's absolutely vital. And I think it's really important that our schools recognise that. I mean, there will always be a commentary in any Eston inspection about the use of Welsh and how the Welsh culture and language are promoted and developed. And Councillor Pavia rightly mentioned uh, the the excellent work in, um, in St Mary's to do that. So I think all of our schools are, are working hard on it and it's certainly one of the things that uh, our support teams when they go to visit schools are conscious of to try and promote that use of incidental Welsh and it's lovely to hear it when you do hear it and it happens so often in classrooms now you know some of those kind of settling instructions the preparation and so on are all done through the medium of Welsh. Um, in terms of the, the broader piece the community and so on um, we need to work with our colleagues in a near and so on in the Welsh language team um, to make sure we're developing those opportunities for the communities more broadly. Thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you, Will. Um, I'd like to thank you on behalf of, the, of uh, us councillors uh, for sharing your report and uh, answering all our questions. Thank you. Uh, right, we move on to um, uh, item eight, uh, motions to the council, uh, and over to Councillor John, please. 
Um, Chair, could I just interrupt for a moment? I'd like to um, say I have a prudential, prudential um, interest in this, so I'm going to leave um, for this motion. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. Well, we're blessed in Monmouthshire, I think, um, amongst the, the 46 of us to represent some of the most beautiful parts of rural Wales. Um, the Wye Valley, um, what I suppose I should call the Banai Brachiniog National Park, so I don't get into trouble. Uh, the Gwent Levels, uh, Market Towns, the Monmouthshire and Brecon Canal. Um, I think more castles per square mile than almost anywhere else. Uh, the rolling hills of the Usk Valley, amongst many others that I'm sure individual ward members could name. As a local authority, I think we've got many fantastic tourist attractions within our own ownership, and I, I pay tribute to the Mon Life team for the work they do in showcasing these attractions. Tourism is vital to the economy that we care so much about in these rural communities. Tourists contribute nearly £200 million annually to the economy here in Monmouthshire, and they sustain over 3,000 jobs in the local tourism industry. Across Wales, one in seven jobs is in the tourism sector, and certainly until the pandemic, it was a growing part of the Welsh economy. Sadly, tourism in Wales has not yet recovered to pre-pandemic levels. Despite being so integral to the value of the Welsh economy, I think it's disappointing that the Welsh Government is sadly no friend to the tourism industry here. This is a Welsh Government that has recently increased the threshold that holiday lets need to achieve to remain on business rates and avoid being stung by massive council tax rises, including the council tax premiums uh, of up to 300%, such as those recently introduced by the new administration here. I'm disappointed that holiday lets that don't meet the 182-day uh, threshold was not a consideration when the administration uh, proposed this council tax surcharge. Instead, I felt there was a determination to introduce additional taxes, and I recall how Councillor Rook spoke for the whole Labour group when he said, tax them, tax them to the hilt. As of April 2023, the number of days that a self-catering holiday let must be occupied more than doubled from 70 days a year to 182. Now, this change has had a significant impact on the tourism sector. The wards with the highest density of holiday lets in Monmouthshire are Crucorny and Mitchell Troy and Trellick United. Profit margins for many tourism businesses in these areas are already perilously slim. The increase to 182 days has caused significant worry and stress to many business owners. For many of these businesses, this council tax rate is unaffordable, which is leading them to consider closing their businesses, which will not only impact the tourism sector, but our economy more widely. Another impact of the 182-day change that the Welsh Government made was seen in a survey recently commissioned by a leading holiday company that found that almost three quarters of holiday let owners were said to be considering selling up because of the, the increased regulatory and financial threat to their businesses. Now, a tourism tax would be massively damaging to Monmouthshire's tourist economy, adding extra costs to businesses in an area where tourists visiting the Wye Valley already have a choice as to which side of the river to visit. In the Welsh Government's own consultation on the proposals, 78% of respondents opposed plans for local authorities to gain discretionary powers to impose a tourism tax. It's been estimated that based on average costs in mainland Europe, the tax could add £75 to the cost of a weekly holiday for a family here in Wales. So I asked the administration today, if you do support a tourism tax, perhaps you could justify it and perhaps you could tell us where the money would be spent. I note the former leader of Plaid Cymru, uh, who agreed the Welsh Government's cooperation uh, agreement with Mark Drakeford, said that money raised from a tourism tax shouldn't be spent on tourism or infrastructure in a local authority, but should be spent on free school meals for all pupils. I'd be interested in the administration's view on that. Our economy is still in a fragile state, and I think a tourism tax poses grave dangers for businesses here. 
Not only would it be devastating for businesses and our economy, but it would also leave jobs hanging in the balance. The implementation of a tourism tax would make Wales an outlier in the United Kingdom and put up increased barriers to tourism at the exact moment we should be encouraging people to come here and spend money. So today, as the Conservative group, we're calling on Council to support our tourism industry and rule out the introduction of a tourism tax here in Monmouthshire. Thank you very much and I look forward to hearing contributions from members. Thank you, Councillor John. Um, I move to Councillor Garrick. Is there a oh, sorry, I do apologise. Is there a seconder for the motion? Thank you, Tony. Deal, Councillor Garrick. Council, this appears to be Project Fear on tour. The Welsh Government proposals concluded consultation on a visitor levy in December. It would be imprudent and reactionary to set a policy in this chamber of non-acceptance on a set of proposals which are not fully understood due to the fact that the proposals themselves are not fully published. Given that, I am truly disappointed to see this motion raised by Councillor John. It's purely raising anxiety in the residents, business people of our county who need support and assurance that any such policy will be laid out rationally and fairly by Welsh Government and if um, adopted by Mamusha ourselves and done with a definite consideration of the economic impacts. Also, at this stage, there's no clarity on the expectation of Welsh Government on councils to use the ability to implement a visitor levy. We are unclear, for example, if there would be a calculation integrated into our funding settlement which anticipates the value of revenue raised by our council through a visitor levy which could reduce our funding grant. There are several research, research projects being carried out by Welsh Government on the matter, which will inform the policy that is finally developed. These include establishing the impact of a visitor levy on businesses, looking at the demographic of businesses across the tourism sector in Wales, and including factors such as lower cost overnight accommodation offered by businesses such as campsites and hostels. The research also includes visitor economy tax systems in countries similar to our own here in Wales, which will give a clear understanding of the impacts of the proposals. This isn't being done blindly. It's hinging on research and will be well thought out and unhurried, unlike this proposal. We cannot make any clear deliberation on this matter until the proposals themselves are well researched and presented. It's also notable that the proposal for a visitor levy is one requested by the people of Wales through consultation. The motion and its supporters would have us believe that this is a Welsh Government motion which flies in the face of reason and the wants of our residents and the citizens of Wales. It has been proposed by our citizens and has, as the proposals for increased taxation on second and empty homes, which gained significant support during our consultation process earlier this year. This also has a significant public support and as I have laid out it is being developed with an appropriate amount of complementary research. I'm therefore not going to spend a lot of time pointing to the over 40 countries across the world with successful tourism economies who have already adopted tourism taxes. The Welsh Government itself describes the visitor levy proposals in the following words during its consultation. The visitor levy is not intended to put people off visiting Wales. Instead, we propose that it would be a small contribution by overnight visitors that will generate additional revenue for local authorities to reinvest in local communities. This would enable them to address some of the costs associated with tourism and encourage a more sustainable approach. The whole key to these proposals are to reinvest into public service that we provide to our residents. So, if we look to Scotland, the implementation of the North Coast, North Coast 500 Tourism Trail has been successful in boosting tourism. It's also bred dissatisfactions with the residents of Caithness and Sutherland <coughs> due to the additional strain that it has brought on its public services. 
When Wales has a £5 billion pound per year tourism industry, the levy presents a significant opportunity for councils and the nation to improve inward investment to, into our public services. In Monmouthshire, we have around 100,000 visitors each year with an average accommodation spend of around 65 million per annum. These are based on the 27 to 2019 figures published by the Welsh Government. We have around 500 accommodation establishments with around 8,300 bed spaces. During that 2017 to 2019 period, we averaged roughly 1.1 million overnight stays per year. There are several ways that the council could ultimately apply a visitor levy it chose to, but for example, and this is not an intention of the council, this is just an example, a flat rate of £1 per stay overnight is applied. That would equate simply to a £1.1 million income. That could, for instance, almost close the gap on the level of overspend that we have seen addressing the homelessness interest issue in our council in the past year, which came in at 1.4 million. Council, I cannot therefore, with a policy that is in its infancy, agree that our council would commit to a policy of non-adoption, which could be detrimental to our residents and I will therefore not be supporting this motion and would urge you not to either. We can return to this at a point when we can have a coherent discussion on the policy as it is published. Diolch Cadarit. Diolch uh, Councillor Garrick. Councillor Bryn, please. Diolch Cadarit. Um, I'd be interested to hear of any evidence of proven negative effect to this proposed tourist tax beyond the anecdote that it might put people off coming. Surely these taxes, if ring-fenced, could potentially be instrumental in providing much-needed support for underfunded local services. A survey led by Edinburgh Council suggested that the negative impact would in fact be very low, with only 2% of respondents stated that they would not visit an area if a nominal £1 or £2 tax was imposed, and I believe in Manchester 80% of hoteliers supported the levy which is now going to be put into place. The Bevan Foundation argues that a tourist tax would help reflect the true cost of tourism. We do need to help, help maintaining footpaths, wildflower borders, car parks and cleaning up litter. We cannot keep relying so heavily on the goodwill of volunteers. As such, I cannot um, support this motion. Dior. Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Bryn. Um, Councillor Neil? Thank you, Chair. Uh, who would trust the Welsh Government with a new tax? Um, it really would be the thin end of a wedge and the potential for being a Trojan horse. So starting with a 50 pence per night charge, that uh, already uh, would be for a family of five, two pounds fifty per night. How soon would it become a two pounds fifty or a five pounds fifty? And at what point would that damage to the tourism sector be acknowledged? Uh, at which point the damage would already be done? It's not appropriate to see visitors to our country as an opportunity to tax rather than a sector with the opportunity to thrive. The fact that 40 countries, as Councillor Garrick states, have adopted this um, around the world means, of course, that 155 have not. The timing is absolutely dreadful to even be considering this with the Western world economies, including, of course, Wales, struggling after two years of COVID, followed by the economic shock arising from a war in Ukraine. The concept should simply be put into cold storage until such time that Wales has that buoyant, prosperous economy that the public sector Wales' wellbeing plan envisages. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Councillor Neil. Um, Councillor Dimmock, please. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, I'm going to support Councillor John's motion. Um, in answer to your question, Councillor Bryn, the WTA, which is the Welsh Tourism Alliance, which I think we could say they're, they're experts in this industry, do not support the tourism tax because of it, the damage it could potentially cause. The, te the tax will apply to any visitors, regardless, regardless whether they live in Wales or Monmouthshire. 
So that includes all of the members here, all our colleagues, our residents, as well as those who've traveled from further afield. Uh, it would apply to any sort of accommodation, including caravan, motorhomes, holiday lets and hotels. It would have a detrimental impact on the Monmouthshire brand and prospects. It undermines the policies to create more healthy and active Wales and disproportionately impacts those least able to afford to take a holiday further afield. Do we really want to do that to them? It will deter visitors rather than enhancing Monmouthshire tourism. Offer instead would worsen Monmouthshire's position as an attractive tourist destination as visitor economy grapples with the cost of living crisis, as colleagues have said today. One in seven jobs in Wales on to uh, rely on tourism, and the data shows that the pro profile of tourism workers is generally younger, between the ages of 16 and 24. Do we really want to impact their earning opportunities? The tax is used in other countries to deter the number of visitors. Wales does not suffer from over-tourism. It is a vital sector of the Welsh economy and should be encouraged, not taxed. And I know Councillor Garrick referenced the countries who apply tourism level, but many overseas countries with tourism taxes have significantly lower or no VAT applied. The WTA suggests introducing a tourism level would be a form of double taxation when compared to other destinations. So we really cannot go forward with this. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Dimmock. Uh, Councillor Butler. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Self-catering and accommodation businesses such as hotels and guest houses throughout Wales have suffered an alarming drop in visitors this year. From anecdotal evidence, there are a mixture of reasons for this. Cost of living pressures are obviously playing a part, and it's a worrying time for many. Many tourism businesses are stressed and worried about the future. Monmouthshire is a place that has historically welcomed visitors, and this enables local independent businesses to exist and helps to generate income for our county. With a threat of a loop of a tourism, sorry, a threat of a tourism tax looming, there is a danger that if the current administration follows the line from the Welsh Labour government and imposes a tax on our visitors, our local small and micro businesses in Monmouthshire will suffer irreparable harm. During the COVID period, Mark Drakeford and his colleagues effectively told the rest of the United Kingdom to stay out of Wales by imposing further crippling lockdowns when England was open for business. The reason I'm stating this is because I know that it's been cited as a feeling that visitors from further afield are not welcome here, and many tourism businesses in Wales have been told this by their guests. If this minority administration considers it appropriate to impose such an ill-thought-out tax on our visitors, the Conservatives will strongly oppose this. In a time of international unrest and global economic problems, this is not the way to bring back visitors and welcome travellers to our beautiful country. County. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Butler. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, please. <laughs> Thanks very much, Chair. Uh, as the Economy Cabinet Minister, I've attended a number of meetings with tourist business owners, tourist operators in Monmouthshire. They are indeed impressive people. They are the foundation of that proportion of the county's economy, measured at about 7%, which derives from our visitors. I think everyone in this chamber, including myself, value these people. They have been scarred by the COVID experience, not scarred by the policies of the Welsh Government, scarred by the experience. They weren't the people who were holding parties and dancing, waiting for their honours from the Prime Minister's list. They were clinging on to a business which they're now working hard to rebuild. And we should all recognise that it's a difficult task. There was evidence of some recovery from COVID, the cost of living crisis, the increase in price of energy, the increase in price of food, a stark fall in demand, about to be exacerbated by the rise in mortgage interest payments. 
those circumstances are making life very difficult for this industry across the UK and in this country. In the meetings that I've had with these business owners, there was concern, but serious discussion about the visitor levy. Some were very well informed, put an enormous amount of effort, far more, I suspect, than some of the contributors of this debate into what was being proposed by the Welsh Government, and they've submitted very full information in response. Very often, their response was not opposition in principle. Their response was a very well argued and I think justifiable demand for a lot more detail about the nature of the levy and the way in which it would be administered. There were others who justifiably had gone to less efforts. They were less informed and they were fearful. And we must recognise that fear and take care about the way we conduct these debates because we can exacerbate those fears unjustifiably. They were concerned about their investments. They were asking if they were in the right business. They were serious people with serious concerns and I took them seriously. And what I shared with them was all the information that I had and I took great care wherever it was possible to allay the fears that they had. I explained that the Welsh Government, at the time of, the time of my meeting, had consulted and was consulting, depending on which meeting it was, on the principle of whether or not to have a visitor levy in Wales and how it should be administered. I continue to explain that the Welsh Government is still considering the response to that consultation. Contrary to many assertions in this debate, no decision on the levy or its detail has been made. The Welsh Government is in listening and consulting mode. I stress, contrary again to this debate, that no decision has been made on what the scale of the levy would be in Wales. Reference has been made here to 50 pence, to one pound, to there is no decision. And partly that is because the Welsh Government has deliberately set out to make this an evidence-based consultation, discussion and ultimately decision. So it has commissioned research on what it refers to as the elasticities of demand in the tourism industry. It is trying to find the research which will tell them what sort of impact, if any, would different levels of the tax have. And insofar as it will set the levy at a particular rate, it will be informed by research which has yet to be completed and reported. I explain that to the businesses in Monmouthshire. I explain that the Welsh Government has asked the Welsh Revenue Authority to spend the next year developing advice on the possible administrative framework for a levy. Now I think that's actually very, very important because if we get this wrong, the Welsh Government gets it wrong. I fear that the greatest dis disincentive to business may not be the scale of the levy, but any administrative burden associated with it. So actually spending a year looking at the administrative framework and learning from that research will be very important to the businesses in Monmouthshire. It will be well into 2024 before those pieces of research are producing the results for Welsh Government and ourselves. That research will inform the drafting of legislation. That will take well over a year and probably longer for any of us who've had experience of the legislative process. I explained to the businesses in, in Monmouthshire that a reasonable estimate of the timing of introducing a bill to the Senate, if things go well for Welsh Government with all the, all the procedures that's put in place, would be that a bill could be reduced, could be introduced in around 2026 it might receive royal assent after a year's scrutiny at Senate level with all the representations of the tourist industry. It could receive, on a fast track, royal assent by 2027. 
we know enough from the consultation paper that should it receive royal assent, there would then be a period in which any local authority, and remember, every local authority will have its own choice whether to go down this route or not. Somebody referred to the Labour group in this council having some sort of Welsh Labour line from Welsh government to say there will be a levy. There is no line. What Welsh government is doing is empowering local authorities to make their own decision. Not telling them, empowering them. Now if, come 2027, probably after the next council election, there was interest in this council, in this levy, for this council, it would be required, I've no doubt by the legislation, to undertake thorough consultation with the people in Monmouthshire. All interested groups, residents affected by tourism, tourism operators, whoever they may be, will participate in that consultation. Should that council, <coughs> listening to that consultation, choose to continue with a levy, one will know, again it's there in the consultation paper, that there would be a period of notice, probably a year. I am able to tell the business operators in all honesty in Monmouthshire that if there is going to be a levy on that sort of timetable, they are unlikely to have to challenge, to charge it, whatever it might be, before around 2029. Today we're in this chamber in 2023 and we've got a motion which actually anticipates, which actually, not anticipates, which actually prevents all that consideration, all that debate, all that consultation and says we'll decide now, not knowing what the levy will be, not knowing the evidence on its impact, not knowing the administrative framework, we will decide now that there should be no discussion in Monmouthshire. It is an absurd proposition. I truly wish it would be withdrawn even at this stage. But it won't. And the reason that it won't is that it is a general election in the offing. And this motion has been tabled simply as a piece of electioneering for an election outside this chamber. It is motivated by that faction of the Conservative Party which plays on fear at every opportunity. It is seeking votes by stoking fear. That's what it does. That's what it did in Brexit. That's what it's doing now. It stokes up an unjustified fear and then presents the Conservative Party as the saviour to something which will never happen in the way it's described. Councillor Griffiths, can I... Uh, you've I got don't a minute believe... Left. Thank you. Sorry, I don't believe... Um, that this motion is justified. I wish it was withdrawn. If not, I ask that you vote against it. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Um, Councillor Fuchs, please. Dioch, Chair. Um, well, yeah, as Councillor Griffiths has so eloquently said, um, this motion preempts any kind of discussion and consultation that. Uh, will be done if indeed the um, Act makes it through the Senate in 2027. Um, so we need to wait. We need to wait until we have a full consultation with tourism businesses um, and with people in Monmouthshire, and that's what we, we should do. And we certainly shouldn't be ruling out a tourism tax at this point. Um, tourism plays an incredibly big part in my ward, that's Town Ward in Monmouth, and it does, of course, in the whole county. So we shouldn't rush to exclude or include this tourism tax as an option. And people have spoken already about tourism taxes being used around the world. One of the things they're used for is to enable further investment, as Councillor Bryn so eloquently said, in other tourism infrastructure, in our services, but also in reducing the impact of tourism on the environment. We could use the money raised from a tourism tax, for example, to invest in more of the fantastic electric buses, like the one I went on the other day on the number 65 bus route. Or 
or we could use it, for example, to do something incredibly important to tourism in our area, which is to clean up our rivers. Because our rivers, a huge amount of tourism economy comes from uh, the use of our rivers. So I think charging a tourist tax, if it was decided that we wanted to do it, would tell the world we are really proud of what we have and that we know what it is worth. Clearly the Tories don't seem to know the worth we have in this county. And it also seems that they are clinging to the misplaced and discredited view that market forces are the answer to everything. Well, they're not. Taxes are a way of sharing responsibility and perhaps, as Councillor Rook would say, expressing solidarity. These are the values which the party opposite can obviously not get their heads around, but which I believe visitors to our beautiful, beautiful county would fully understand and share. So I would urge all councillors to oppose this motion. Uh, thank you, Councillor Fuchs. Uh, Councillor Birch, please. Thank you, Chair. So what makes a great holiday? I think the starting point is the company and the weather, and that's largely outside our control. But obviously, it's also a great visitor experience in the whatever place you choose to visit. So it's the landscape, it's the high quality accommodation, clean streets, good signage, no litter, events to visit, things going on, festivals, markets, toilets that are open, long hours, decent parking, that you can find and you can charge your car and a warm welcome in the tourist information and all of those things cost money and i have the privilege of representing a ward which does suffer from too many visitors um, to the sugarloaf and where we don't currently have the infrastructure um, to deal with those visitors because we don't have the money to provide it and nor do our partners uh, the national trust or the bbnp so just giving that as an example there is an opportunity here. A tourism tax was the idea was designed to actually mitigate some of the impacts of over visitation where that happens and to support the provision of a good visitor experience. And what brings people in is a strong online presence. It's advertising, it's building our brand and the Visit Monmouthshire team do a fantastic job in that, in building the Monmouthshire brand and, uh, and advertising our county to people who may want to visit. Um, but they do it on an absolute shoestring. How much more could be done with more resources put into promotion of Monmouthshire? Um, and how much would that benefit our uh, tourism industry and the... Uh, the tourism providers themselves. But on the other hand, I recognise the fears of this. So this is, to my mind, a finely balanced argument. And as Councillor Griffith says, it is some years off this council actually needing to make a decision about this. And when we do, I think people should be assured that we will look at all the options as always, and make that decision with our tourism industry and make the decision that is right for Monmouthshire. So I hope that we can reject this motion today. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Birch. <laughs> Councillor Keir. Thanks very much, Chair. Um, I often try to remind myself why I'm here. I've been voted in to represent the community of Ask and Clumbaddock, the businesses and, and the residents. And with any new tax, there will always be two sides of the story. Some will agree and some will disagree. I'm very pleased at the moment to be uh, leading a new group in Ask Reformation of the Chamber of Commerce, in that the businesses are getting together for the benefit of the town. We're very fortunate. The main aim is a destination place where we rely heavily on visitors, heavily on visitors. And the community so far, the business community so far in the initial discussions we've had is how can we improve that? This weekend in Usk is Usk Open Gardens. 
some of you may have been there, and if you haven't, I really would encourage you to come and have a look. Nearly £300,000 has been raised for good causes over the 20-odd years. And we've had visitors from all over the world come and look in that regard. You know, we do have one of the many castles in Monmouthshire. We have the Usk in Bloom. And, of course, some of you may well have recently seen Usk celebrating a world-famous man, Alfred Russell Wallace. The, co the surrounding communities areas of the ward just outside Usk have self-catering and camping. And, of course, we have, as you rightly say, been suffering because of the economic fragility on, on the back of COVID. I would like just to say thank you to Councillor Griffiths for some of the comments that you've made, because again, you said two sides of the story. And you did highlight from your discussions the concerns that businesses have. And my job here is to represent the businesses in my hometown. And I don't agree with Councillor Garrett that this is project fear on tour. It isn't project fear. These are genuine comments from people that I represent. They have fears about the basic principle of a tourism tax. We are allowed to have an opinion. Too often in this chamber, frankly, there are differing... I don't like the attitude about the fact that we do have opinions. I respect people's opinions. I might not agree with them, but I respect them, and that's the way it should be. So on this particular point, when I talk to the businesses that I hope to be representing over the next four years or so, that I will take on board what they have to say and I will report them back to this council. And at the moment, not one has come to me and said, I'm in favour of this. They've asked me to say, no, they don't want it. So from my perspective, I'm not giving a personal view here. I'm representing my constituents. And I'll be voting, as I said, I've seconded this motion in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Councillor Keir. Uh, are we OK to move to a vote? Councillor John. Point of order, um, Chair. So, sorry, before Richard John proceeds to conclude, m might I suggest, given, the, um, given that emotions are, are running so, so high, um, might we put this to a recorded vote? If I've understood the Constitution correctly, Section 27, Subsection 27, Clause 3, allows us, if nine of us demand a recorded vote, to put the motion to a recorded vote rather than the customary electronic voting. Would that be in order, Chair? A point, um, point of information, point, point of information, Chair. I don't feel the motions are running high. I think we've had a very considered, informed, and informative debate. Point of order, Chair. I think nine members have got to stand before the before the discussion start. If there are nine that want a reported vote, I'm sure that they do. They can be a recorded vote. If there, if there are nine that re, uh, request a recorded vote, then uh, we can have a recorded vote. One, two, three. Mm -hmm. so, so that's sufficient. We're that's happy. sufficient for a recorded vote. Councillor John. Thank you very much. Uh, well, thank you to everyone who's, who's contributed. Um, uh, I listened very carefully to the contributions of, of Labour members, and um, I don't think the initial remarks tax them, tax them to the hilt, uh, that far off the mark. Um, Councillor Garrick talked about other members, uh, other countries in the world that have uh, a tourism tax, and there are a number of them. Um, I mean, no offence to the tourism attractions we have in Monmouthshire, but um, certainly the Seychelles and the Maldives do have a particular appeal of, of their own. Um, I note that some of the countries that you might be particularly fond of politically, like Cuba, Venezuela, they have a tourism tax. Um, the point that was made was, was that this will be a very small contribution to, to the council's revenue. Well, uh, I remember that being said when um, uh, you tried to increase charges for things like uh, breakfast clubs, green bins. We know that that was a, a small charge when it was first introduced. You uh, doubled it to, to £50 this year. You tried to double the charge for breakfast clubs. 
So it's, it's precisely as Councillor Neil said, there's a danger of the thin end of the wedge. And of course, uh, he, he made that warning, and then we heard uh, Councillor Bryn, Councillor Fuchs, and Councillor Birch uh, basically say that this, this should be a cash cow, that we should be able to spend the money on infrastructure, on buses, cleaning up the rivers, car parks, tackling litter, and funding all sorts of council services. So it really makes you wonder what sort of level a, a, a tourist tax needs to be um, pitched at to uh, fund all those services that you've already listed. Uh, Councillor Dimmock is absolutely right, I think, at uh, uh, challenging economic times as we're in at the moment. Um, a tax would certainly deter hard-pressed families who want to have a cheaper staycation uh, here in the UK rather than travelling abroad. Um, and she also made a really important, really valuable point, I think, about the impact that this would have on some of the lowest paid workers in our county. Um, I, I think Councillor Butler was absolutely right in, in what she was saying. I, I, um, I, I support the, the points that, that she made. Um, and I think Councillor Keir set out um, some of the tourism attractions in his own ward. And I know of the work he's doing very effectively, uh, in, uh, particularly in, in us liaising with local businesses and making sure that their voice is heard in this chamber. And I, I think you do it very effectively. Um, I listened carefully also to Councillor Griffiths, who talked about those those COVID restrictions that were particularly onerous um, on tourism operators in Wales, far more draconian here than they were in England. Um, I was pleased to hear him say that Welsh Government is in listening mode, so presumably if they are really in listening mode, they will listen to the 78% of people who responded to the Welsh Government's own consultation, saying that effectively that this is a terrible idea and it should be binned. Um, I, I also heard his point that this will be some years ahead. Well, obviously businesses will, will want to plan ahead for uh, challenges coming down the line. Um, I note that the changes that Welsh Government made to uh, holiday let uh, operators, um, those changes were voted on in July 2022 and have already been introduced. They were introduced in April 23. So there's an example of something Welsh Government have introduced in the face of opposition from the tourism sector where they didn't listen to uh, people who know best, people who actually work in tourism and operate those businesses. They introduced something with a very short notice period and that's already having a damaging impact on tourism operators. Um, so I really disagree with the point that Councillor Griffiths was making, that this somehow empowers local authorities to introduce crippling new taxes on people who want to come here and enjoy the uh, tourism attractions we have. Um, I support the point made by uh, colleague Councillor Davis that we, we have a proper vote here so that we can all be held to account for the decisions that we've made, um, and I hope that members will support the motion. Thank you very much. <coughs> Thank you, Councillor John. Uh, we move uh, to vote. Um, Nicola, yeah. Okay. okay um, Councillor Jill Bond. <coughs> Councillor Brocklesby. Against. Councillor Brown. For the motion. Councillor Bryn. Against. Councillor Birch. Against. Councillor Be Butler. For. Councillor Callard. Against. Councillor Chandler. Against. Councillor Crook. Against. Councillor Davis. For the motion. Councillor Dimmock. For the motion. Councillor Eason. Against the motion. Councillor Edwards. For the motion. Councillor Fuchs. Against. Councillor Garrett. Against. Councillor Garrick. Against. Councillor Griffiths. Against. Councillor Grocutt. Against. Councillor. Councillor Howells. I'll abstain. Councillor John. Four. 
Councillor David Jones. Stephen. Councillor Penny Jones. Four. Councillor Kia. Four. Councillor Lane. Four. Councillor Lucas. Four. Councillor Maybe. Against. Councillor McConnell. Against. Councillor McKenna. Four. Councillor Murphy. Four. Councillor Neil. Four. Councillor Pavia. Four. Councillor Powell. Four. Councillor Riley. Against. Councillor Rook. Against. Councillor Sandals. Against. Councillor Stevens. Against. Councillor Jackie Strong. Against. Councillor Penny. Uh, Penny. Sorry, Peter Strong. <laughs> It's been a long day. <laughs> haven't changed my gender yet. Uh, against. <laughs> Give him time. Councillor Tudor Thomas. Against. Counsel Councillor Wright. Against. Okay, thanks. Uh, that, that's been defeated. Uh, we move on to uh, the next question from... Sorry, on to questions, sorry. Uh, so, members' questions. Uh, Councillor John. Um, would you like to come back to me, as I think the, the leader's just popped out. <laughs> Thank you. If you want to take the urgent question that's been added, I'm quite happy to take that. Chair. If, if it's okay, Chair, I was just thinking to save time, if, if you wanted to bring forward the urgent additional question, that I'd be, I'm quite happy to take, to take sure. that now. Uh, Councillor Edwards, are you okay with that? We have a, an urgent question. Yes, thank you, Chair. And, and can I thank the monitoring officer and Councillor maybe for agreeing to this urgent question uh, today. Settle down, everyone. Uh, Chepster was about to experience major music events over three consecutive days where it will encounter a record number of visitors to an area that is renowned for traffic congestion. Now, councillors and residents want to see businesses thrive, Chepstow prosper, and the town remain a happy place for residents to live, work, and play. Residents' concerns are real and based on evidence, having experienced such events and activities in the area, but on a much smaller scale. So what reassurances can the Cabinet member give residents of mine and surrounding wards that the Council's traffic management plans will work and that residents won't feel trapped in their homes or have their streets used as rat runs or car parks for visitors? Will the Council also take on board feedback provided before and after the temporary traffic regulation order is in force and act on it to improve the lives of residents? Now, I understand I've, I've had a few emails since um, I asked this question or raised it this morning, so I'm pleased with the response so far. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Edwards, and I totally appreciate your concern. There's quite major events coming up um, for not this weekend, the weekend after. Um, so I will answer it to the best of my ability. Um, first, I should emphasise that as a council, we, we don't run these events and we can't prevent them, but we do our very best to, to minimise the disruption to residents. Um, um, and secondly, that the traffic management plans themselves are those actually of the event holder. It's our role simply to agree them. Um, having said that, um, I believe an engagement event was held with local residents. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I don't, I don't believe Councillor Edwards was there, but that, I think it's helpful to know that it existed um, and that discussion has been had. Um, I have looked into what the plans are that have been made following that, and they are fairly extensive. Um, they include, for example, shuttle buses from Newport Station, park and ride 
upgrade facilities, uh, one-way loops for traffic leaving the concert. That's often a, a, a difficult time at the end of these concerts. Um, and also pre-booked on-site parking, um, and also a warning sent to ticket holders that there is very limited parking. Um, and these plans, I believe, have also been based on an analysis of, of postcodes of ticket sales. So it has been thought through quite carefully, um, which indicated that the majority of ticket holders were, would be coming from Cardiff, Newport, and, and Bristol. So it's thinking has been done. I, of course, there will be disruption, I'm afraid, with such events, but I think um, a good deal of work has been done to minimise any negative impacts. Um, and finally, just to say, um, officers have said, of course, if you want to look at particular detail, particular roads that you're concerned about, then do please ask them. But I have noted that today um, the technical um, officer involved has just circulated some more detailed plans. It's quite difficult to, to put them on email. Um, but she's she's copied what she could and put them on email. But do please feel free to follow up with her, Councillor Edwards, if you want very particular detail about individual streets. So I hope I hope that uh, answers your question. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Councillor. Maybe um, if I just um, add further to this, only only very briefly. But um, I think the point is here that we need to learn from this. My my concern is that there's also been no engagement with local councillors and residents on this traffic management plan. And, but I'm grateful that highways have, have decided to consult on this now, although there is only eight days to go. And I'm, like I said earlier on, I'm pleased that um, already some changes have been made in relation to this feedback that residents have provided. Um, residents have shown concerns about poor level of communication. Ironically, I, I couldn't actually attend that event, um, the public engagement uh, session that uh, Chepster Racecourse held because I was attending an event, I'm afraid. But um, let's have more communication about um, the traffic measures put in place, and I hope that we will learn from this, take on board this feedback from residents, so that we not only ensure that this doesn't happen again, but also that we want to see that um, a local business thrive. We want to see events successfully run and residents con content that the council is working well with vet ven uh, venues and event organisers. I know there's plenty of good intention there. I've, I've had conversations with officers myself and some good work has been carried out in the background. But sometimes this doesn't convey itself to residents um, when they feel that decisions are made without basing those decisions on this experience. Experience and and their feedback, but I thank officers for for the work they've done um, so far. Thank you. May I comment just very quickly? Of, of course. Comment, yeah. Just to say, indeed, an engagement event was held, and I would encourage councillors to, um, in advance, to to talk to um, to officers about traffic management and perhaps participate in communicating the information to residents. I know it's it's not easy, and you'll never reach everyone, and everyone will feel there's always going to be people who feel they've not been spoken to. But perhaps we can do our best just to support officers on those communications whenever there's events in our wards. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Maybe. Thank you, uh, Councillor Edwards. Uh, uh, Councillor John, over to you. The question. Uh, thank you very much. A question to the leader. Uh, would the leader make a statement, please, about the relationship that the administration has with the Welsh Government? Thank you, Dan. Councillor John. Of course, I will. Um, I want to start this station statement by reminding us all of one of the core principles of the community and corporate plan, and that is to work in partnership, and to always work in partnership. And as um, Councillor John pointed out to me on numerous occasions, the council has been working in partnership for a very long time <laughs> in various ways. But perhaps its partnership with uh, Welsh Government has been not as good as we hoped to make it, and I'm very happy to give uh, Councillor John and everybody else in, can in um, Council some relationship advice around how we have been working together. For us, it's a principle that we work with all groups and we work them with them around a common purpose. Always, always, 
mindful of our values and strategic priorities. So it can be the UK government, and we've had fruitful discussions with our MP, the um, Honourable Secretary of State for Wales, on the river health issue, for example. Um, it's the Wales, Welsh government, our community councils, our town councils, and most particularly our citizens in various ways. And we'll collaborate with whoever. We'll collaborate where there are opportunities for Monmouthshire, but also when we can further our priorities and strategic objectives. You'll know that our relationship with the Welsh Government is a key one, and an important part of doing business. Since forming the administration last year, we have invested considerable time in the relationship, both directly and indirectly through our other partnerships and with ministers around policies and through our officers. Because we recognise that to deliver on our six strategic objectives, we need close and very constructive relationships with our colleagues in Cardiff. We also have direct relationship that we, we maintain that di dialogue at a political level with individual ministers. Um, one example I could uh, give you is around um, the a MA4 link, A48 link, in that we were disappointed by the response uh, in the a road review, but that was not the moment to just accept it. It was a moment to enter into robust dialogue, putting the position of Monmouthshire and to continuing to do so. And currently we are in a very con constructive process, which as and when details emerge, we will report back to council. And that's how you have a good partnership. And I feel this has been a theme of this council um, for the, the last time how many hours, about how we work in, count, in partnership and what a good partnership looks like through our various endeavours in education, through uh, local councils when it's about um, traffic movements, um, various ways that we've brought it up, even the way we uh, consult around tourism tax, if that should ever come to fruition, given as a long process to go through the Welsh Government. But nevertheless, my point here is that we engage in order to ensure that we can move forward on our strategic objectives, many of which are in harmony with the policies of the Welsh Government, um, the framework which we all freely and fully accept, such as the Wellbeing and Future Generations Act. Um, but there will be points of divergence and there will be points where we must put forward what is important to our residents and what is part of what we are being held accountable for around our community and corporate plan and we will continue to do that. And what I would like to emphasise is, it is that relationship aspect with the Welsh Government. It has to be continuous, it has to be persistent, and it has to be in dialogue. And that dialogue has to be indirectly, which we do so through the Welsh Local Government Association, and also through our other partnerships, such as um, EAS or the Cardiff uh, Capital Region. And we, will we are influential on them, and we will continue to press the case, as we have done, uh, myself and Councillor Maybe, for example, on the regional transport group, where we press the case for looking seriously at both regional transport links, but also how we um, deal with the very real challenges that we um, touched on today that our rural residents have to catch a bus or just feel connected by the network. Thank you, Councillor uh, Brocklesby. Um, uh, Councillor John. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much for that answer. I'm pleased you're keen to work with all groups, although a cynic might say you 
might want to work with some groups in this chamber more closely than others, but since the election last year, Labour ministers in Cardiff have, have realised that Monmouthshire exists, which is very welcome. I've noticed that um, they've been falling over each other to come here. You've had over a dozen ministerial visits, from what I can see, including four from Mark Drakeford, including here to County Hall, uh, multiple visits from Vaughan Gething and Jeremy Miles, where they've been parading around a bit like prize peacocks, perhaps ready for the next Labour leadership contest. Um, over a dozen visits in a single year contrast with not a single visit in the previous 12 months, despite multiple invitations from the administration to come here and precious few visits from Welsh Government ministers before that. Do you think it's right that the Welsh Government should show such blatant partisan favouritism to areas represented by the Labour Party? Councillor Jen, I come back to a relationship advice. It takes two to tango. You do need communications that are both ways. Um, and you need to be persistent. I, I think if you um, go and check out the Relate uh, website, you'll discover that communication is the key. And we have been very strong in building that communications. Um, it was very nice for um, First Minister to visit us. He wasn't always visiting in his capacity uh, First Minister to talk about issues on um, f pertaining to this council, and that's all I'm going to discuss. We had um, Oliver Dowden come to visit, and <laughs> I saw what he did after he came to visit us in Chepstow. He was out on the streets having his picture taken. It's not unusual for most sides to do that, but in terms of vi ministerial visits, to this council to discuss council issues, it is because we have worked very carefully, both behind the scenes, through officers and through um, our political um, channels, WLGA um, for example, to encourage them to come here to talk about key issues around transport, around social care, around education, and we will continue to do so. It is They are one of our key partners, and I would emphasize again, we must have strong relationships, and we must have robust relationships. Some of our conversations will be difficult, they will be challenging, they will be fierce, but you keep having to have the dialogue dialogue open to allow yourselves to have that conversation. And that's what we'll continue to do, Councillor John, on behalf of the Council. Thank you, uh, uh, Councillor Brocklesby. Thank you, Councillor John. Uh, over to uh, uh, Councillor jo Jones for your question. Last but not least, Chair. Yeah. Um, can the Cabinet member please explain the administration's plans for the future of the old primary school site in Raglan and the timeline involved? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Jones. So the former Raglan Primary School is subject to long-standing rest restrictions, and those restrictions on its use are associated with the historic title transfer of land at this location between the Diocese, Diocese and Trust and Monmouthshire County Council. The title issues relate back to the transfer of land and property between both parties in 1982, 2000 and 2015 respectively. And despite efforts, efforts having been made to resolve the matter over a number of years, progress has unfortunately been slow. We are pleased to confirm that positive steps have been taken in recent months following a meeting with representatives of both NCC and the Trust and solicitors are instructed in this matter. We're now targeting completion of the necessary transfers before the close of the year. Both the Trust and MCC are committed to seeing this site being repurposed at the earliest opportunity and achieving a resolution which will enable alternatives to be u um, alternative uses to be explored in detail. And that would of course include anything of any alternative community use as both long-standing and previous aspirations of the local community in Raglan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, a new primary school was opened in September um, 2015, and since then the old school has been left to deteriorate, and now, as you know, it's a, a very dilapidated building, um, which is an eyesore to everyone entering Raglan <coughs> village, uh, and it, which relies heavily on tourism. 
There is an infestation of rats, which is being dealt with again at the moment, and there's been theft of materials. It's a blot on the landscape, and it's an embarrassment to, to Monmouthshire County Council, to be honest. And the residents of Raglan have just about had enough. I get so much grief about this, but quite understandably. So I am... Um, it was, And incidentally, it was originally designated as a possible site for affordable housing, which would perhaps be ideal. And, and then as a potential site for a Welsh school, which fell through. So, you know, people are looking at this potential site, so I'm sure something could be done about sorting out the transfer. So can the Cabinet member please reassure me and assure me that I will be updated about any of the changes and the progress and the future of the building so that I can perhaps be involved, but also so I can report back to the residents? Absolutely, yes. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Councillor Garrick. Um, I believe that concludes the, our business for today. Thank you very much. Dioch Var. Afternoon all. Bye-bye.